keen to learn from the expertise that's in this virtual room to help guide our priorities and directions uh, for the well-being of the residents of Essex. And I really do encourage everyone, please give us your honest feedback, both in this meeting uh, and beyond it. Uh, Judith, could I invite you to go around the room so that people can introduce themselves, but we can also at the same time record any apologies and substitutions. Thank you. Um, I've been notified of apologies from, bear with me a second. Georgina Blakemore, Councillor Graham Butland, and Anthony McKeever, uh, for whom I am Stan Joe Cripps is substituting. Sure. Um, Anna Davey will be joining sure. us, but via mobile phone. Okay, so thank I'll you. Go around, um, I think Anna Davey has actually managed to join via a laptop, Judith. I've just seen. Uh, I am actually on my phone, everybody. So, um, but I've got a good connection. I can see you. So. Oh. Thank you. Good morning, Anna. It's lovely to have you here. Next. Thank you, John. Uh, Dr. Hassan Chauhan. Yeah, I just repeat my name. This is Dr. Chauhan, I'm GP from Colchester and Chair of North East Essex CCG. You're always very welcome, Hassan. Thank you. Sam Glover from Healthwatch Essex. Hi, Sam Glover, CEO of Healthwatch Essex. Sam, thank you very much. Nice to see you. Um, Dr. Rob Gurlis. Uh, hello everyone, uh, Rob Gurlis, uh, GP and Chair of West Essex CCG. And Rob, back to being our Prime Representative again, so uh, um, uh, I am. they can say truly of you, this man never dies, never closes like the windmill. Never, keep the, keep <laughs> the portrait in the attic. Uh, Dr Mike Gogarty. Morning Michael. Um, Go to the next one. Mike yet, Judith? I don't. I think Mike may be. I, I would be surprised if Mike's still doing another call as well. So no, he's not. He he just um, he did struggle to get on, and he um, he then was mute. Um, but um, like like Rob, I'm just not moving. Well, one word would have been enough, Mike. But good morning, my friend. Good okay, next. <laughs> I'm Claire Kershaw. Good morning, everyone. Claire Kershaw, Director of Education. I'm substituting for Helen Lincoln, Director of Children's Services. Uh, thank you with all your busy life. Thank you. Next. Um, Councillor Louise McKinley. I'm not sure if she's present. She will be joining us later, I think, so carry on. Councillor John Moran. Morning, John Moran, Member for South from Morden, Deputy Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care. And morning, John. St. Patrick's Day to one and all. Very good. Um, Nick Presmeg. Not sure if he's here yet. He'll be joining next. Right. Um, Dr. Kashif Siddiqui. Uh, morning, John. Dr. Kashif Siddiqui, GP, Castle Point and Watchford, CCG. Good uh, to have you with us as ever. Thanks, Dr. Boye, Boye Teo. Nope. Um, Paul Burstow. Good morning, Dr. Teo here. Oh, GP morning. and yeah, and Chair of Bassett and Brentford CCG. Hi, boy. It's lovely to have you here. Thanks for coming. And before Paul Burstow, more welcome to you. Good morning, John, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Paul Burstow, I'm the Independent Chair of the Harpeture and West Essex Integrated Care System. Sure. Um, Councillor Mark Corey. Good morning, all. Councillor Mark Corey, Leader of Colchester Council, District Leader here, but also lay member. Mark, nice to see you, and thanks for all your help, Mark. Councillor Peter Davey. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Councillor Peter Davey. I'm the chairman of the Essex Association of Local Councils, representing all the town and parish councils in Essex. And I'm also a board member of the National Association, representing 10,000 town and parish councils throughout the UK. I think we should be able to recite it by now, Peter, but it's lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ian Davidson. Not quite yet. And Dr Sunil Gupta. Good morning, my name is Sonam Gupta, I'm a GP and President Chair of the Joint Committee for the Five CCGs in Midland South Essex. And it's an L. Nick Hume. Good morning everybody, Nick Hume, Chief Executive of East Suffolk, North Essex. And it's, just it's terrific to have you with us, Nick, and thanks for all that you've done to help with messages. Uh, Bridget Johnson. 
Uh, Lorraine Jarvis. No. Gavin Jones. No. Uh, Claire Panica. I think Tom Ebel's attending for Claire, isn't oh. he? Thank you. Yes, John, uh, Tom Abel, Deputy Chief Executive for Mid and South Essex Foundation Trust, here for Claire. Good to see you, Tom. Uh, Will Pope. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, Will Pope, the Independent Chair for Suffolk and North East Essex ICS. Paul Scott. Uh, Trevor Smith. Uh, Mike Thorne. Morning, everyone. Uh, Independent Chair of Mid and South Essex Health and Care Partnership. Great to see you, Mike. Uh, Alison Wilson. Uh, Simon Wood. Morning, uh, Simon Wood. Oh. Sorry, Simon, Simon Wood, Regional Director of Strategy and Transformation, NHSC and I, East of England. I mean, thanks, and I got your message. It's good for you to be with us as long as you can. Thank you. Uh, Roger Hurst. Morning, Roger Hurst, Police Fire and Crime Commissioner. Morning, Roger. Um, Deborah Stewart Angus. Good morning, John. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm the Independent Chair for Essex State Planning Adult Sport. Deborah. And David Archibald. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Archibald. I'm the Independent Chair of Essex Safe Guiding Children Board. Excellent, David. Thank you. Is that uh, it? That's the membership. And um, there may be other other. Because I've not heard you introduce yet, um, no. uh, Susanna. No, I'm just sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Chair. I'm Susanna Howard. I'm the ICS Program Director for Suffolk and North East Essex ICS. Thank you. And Jane. Oh, sorry, slow coming off mute. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jane Halpin, Accountable Officer of the West Essex CCG and the Exec Lead for the ICS. Great to see you, Jane. And that leaves Joe Cripps, I think. Uh, morning, Councillor. Joe Cripps, Programme Director for Mid and South Essex Health and Care Partnership. OK, have we missed any others? I know Peter yeah. Fairley's there because I've spoken to him. Will, is there anybody else? And yeah, John sorry. A couple of hands up as well. So um, uh, Andrew Sheldon has his hand up and uh, Gary Himes as well. Andrew. I have a short list, John, of people um, awaiting admission who aren't on either of Judith's attendance list. Can I just read their names out to see whether yeah. it's appropriate to admit them? Thank you. Sue Waterhouse. Is, is anyone aware? Yeah. OK. Brian Barmer. Yes. Brian's uh, the um, uh, GP. Claire Bartoli. Yes. Okay. David Akinsanya. Speaking later. Yes. Okay. Gemma Andrews. Yes. Yes. Okay. And Tricia Dorsey. Yes. yes. Okay. I'll admit to all of those people now. Okay. So uh, good morning to Andrew Sheldon. And I think it was one. Good morning, Andrew. Uh, are you representing somebody, Andrew? I am, John, yes. I'm representing Louise at this meeting. Right, okay, thank you. And there was one other name you mentioned, Peter? We've got three other hands up now, so we've got Gary Himes, Mark Carroll and Gemma Minden. Gary? Good morning, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, Gary Himes, Chair of Health Watch Essex. And this is here, Gary. Gemma? Hi, um, Judith, you can replace Lorraine Jarvis with me. I'm the representative now for Essex Council for Voluntary Services. Morning. So I thought when Lorraine's name was read out that uh, we'd lost Lorraine. So lovely to see you, Gemma. Thank you. And Mark Carroll, I guess, might be representing the Chief Executive. I am, and my, I'm representing myself as well. Uh, two for one. Uh, so Mark Carroll, Exec Director for Place of Public Health. I have also just admitted Michelle Grant Richardson and Nick Pressmag is just joining us. Good, excellent. Well, let's crack on. We uh, uh, That took a little while, but it's always worth people knowing where they are, uh, who's here. And we have the minutes of the last meeting. Are all members content that they were an accurate record? I will take silence to be assent. Unless, Peter, you tell me any thumbs are down. Uh, I have no actions, I'm agreeing those, I've got no actions outstanding that aren't covered elsewhere in the yeah, agenda. Yeah, I'm a hand, but I'm not sure if it's a legacy hand. Which is it, Peter? 
Uh, Gemma Mindham has a hand up. I'm not sure if she has. No, a it's a legacy hand. Apologies. It's all right, you. Uh, we all have to be very athletic with our hands, don't we? So I'm taking there to be no actions arising. Are there any declarations of interest? I will take silence to be no. Uh, I have not been advised of any public speaker. Are, are you aware of any, please, Judith? No, Chairman. There are no public speakers, right. So we're moving on to Mike Gogarty now, I think. Now, Mike, I think the first thing you're going to do is give us a quick update on the latest situation in Essex before you then go on to seek the feedback of the room in terms of priorities for public health. Thank you. Um, thank you, members. Um, so um, the position as we stand in Essex uh, in terms of case rates uh, is currently a positive one, although that is only due to the, um, the efforts of the people of Essex in terms of um, uh, uh, observing the, the restrictions. At the moment, there are no districts in Essex that have got um, a, a rate higher than the, um, the than the England average, which is really really great. Um, the, the, the rates in Essex vary uh, at the high end at the moment in Harlow from fifty six per hundred thousand cases per week to at the low end Malden, which now is nine, which is great. So this is um, the first time for for a while we've seen an area below ten. Um, areas like uh, Tendring, which have had high rates, are, are now seeing um, remarkable um, decreases. So the rate in Tendring is now 28, um, which is, 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 is much less than it was. The only area that's causing me a little concern at the moment is Castle Point, which I think is on the increase. Um, there's no particular reason we can see for that at the moment. Um, I think as, as case rates reduce, there will be sort of um, more of a wobble um, where uh, small, uh, discreet um, increases will be, be much more apparent and um, any outbreaks will, um, will lead to clear increases, although there is no uh, discreet outbreak in, in Canby that, uh, at this point that we're aware of. Again, the positivity rates are low. Um, colleagues will be talking about um, vaccination later, but I think vaccination is absolutely critical. And I think that the most critical bit of the vaccinations at the moment is to make sure those people who are in um, the, the highest risk groups, those people who are clinically extremely vulnerable, those people who are uh, of elder ages are, are covered off. They're the ones who need to be fully vaccinated. <clears throat> so while we look forward to um, to vaccinating the, the, the younger groups, and we absolutely must do that. It is really important to optimise um, the vaccination rates in those who are most vulnerable and those who are most to the disease. So um, I think generally a, a positive position. Um, this is reflected in uh, less pressure on hospitals and reflected on um, low rates of death. Um, I, I think it is important to realise that this is due to the restrictions that um, we have in place at the moment. Uh, and that as they reduce, there will be uh, increased opportunities for the virus to, to spread again. So we need to watch very, very carefully um, as, uh, as restrictions are released um, and that people will need to continue to observe um, uh, social distancing into the future. But most particularly, people will need to uh, ensure that they get vaccinated. We will not see um, herd immunity due to this vaccination. Um, it's not being offered to children. It's probably not quite effective enough. Uh, and there will be a number of people who choose not to have it. So choosing not to have it um, on the basis that other people are going to have it and um, your, there will be herd immunity is absolutely uh, uh, wrong and um, a very, very dangerous strategy if anyone is approaching it. So it's really important that everyone gets vaccinated. Um, so I think broadly a good place at the moment, um, but um, we need to watch very carefully where we are with it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, and allied to this, Mike, uh, is our concern that testing and isolation are being used at sufficient levels. Uh, and on the testing side, I'll just share with the room. Do you want to share what we're planning to do with the test testing and the move to self-testing, Mike? Are you ready uh, thank to you. Do that? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so nationally, um, there's, there will be a move to, uh, particularly next phase, um, for people to uh, regularly test. Um, and the people who particularly have to regularly test are those who um, have children in schools uh, and they can just get tests into the home at the moment and home tests. And also people who have to go to the workplace and will contact lots of other people. So, for example, people who work in supermarkets, for example, or people who drive taxis. Um, so at the moment, um, the people can access these tests. We are looking to 
uh, increase the, the availability to pick up these tests right away across Essex, but there is a postal system as well, which I understand is, is so far a, a lot under capacity. So it's very easy to get tests posted. Uh, I did so last week and got some to my home about a day later. Um, they're very easy to do. Um, the, it, we can get to a place soon where if, as relaxation of lockdown happens, if you want to visit relatives, if you want to visit friends, you can have a lateral flow test before you go, just to make sure that you are safe. Um, the important thing, though, is that um, that people feel able to do this uh, and people feel incentivized to do this. Um, and the issue around that is there are a number of people in, in the workplace who may feel they are financially compromised um, by choosing to um, do the right thing and get tested regularly uh, and then to, to self-isolate if they become positive. So we're looking very closely and working with districts and various at the moment about how we can optimise the opportunities to incentivise people to, to do this work um, some um, districts have been very good at this. Some districts have been less effective, but we need to sort of, um, I think, step up on this one, get the communications right, um, really help people to make the right choice. I think that's particularly important because I think in, in Essex, certainly from the local data we've got, um, while the government are going around saying that one in three cases are asymptomatic, um, all the evidence we've got in Essex is it's almost the other way around, that there are three times as many asymptomatic people as there are symptomatic this is shown from the lateral flow tests that we've been doing with the community. It also was apparent when we did the surge testing in Brentwood um, that the rates are actually much higher than, than that suggested from the symptomatic testing alone. So I think it's really, really important that people who are, have got no symptoms get tested whenever they possibly can, regularly if possible, particularly if they are um, uh, meeting uh, with other people. Thank you. And Mike, we're currently looking at how we can create a regime which is both high high take up of self testing but also making uh testing on site more available but we're looking at the use of libraries where people can collect tests as well so uh, so that's just under exploration um my concern is always that there is no disincentive to testing because you're worried you're going to be isolated and what's come to light in the last few days is actually that the discretion, that the schemes that are available to give people financial compensation while they isolate during to COVID are working, <coughs> with mixed, are working with mixed effectiveness in different parts of the county. But generally, I'd have to say, not working as well as we'd wish. Uh, Mark Corey in Colchester, and I'd want to single you out from what you've been doing in Colchester, thank you. Um, uh, sadly, others are not quite uh, coping as well. So uh, I will be... Uh, trying to sort out with our officers how we can overcome both the misunderstandings and the misapprehensions that exist. Um, Claire Kershaw, just very quickly, and I'm taking you by surprise, but as you're our Director of Education and as you're here, um, have, can you any information about how things are going in schools and the extent of bubbles having to isolate, Claire? Yes, um, it's very new and, and early days at the moment, Councillor Spence, with regard to that. But um, And I did ask the contact tracing team for a full report of the first full week back in secondary schools in my meeting with her this morning for later on this week. The um, number of positive cases being reported to us as a result of the, um, the, the on-site testing in schools moving to home testing is fairly low at the moment. There are some positive tests coming out, which you would expect with regard to the frequency of testing, but I'm not seeing anything... Um, significantly of concern, although the contact tracing team did indicate this morning that um, there has been a, a small increase coming through um, sort of yesterday and into today. So they are going to keep a, a watch on that, but nothing of alarm or concern in terms of the impact of, of schools returning per se, but we have seen uh, positive cases coming through. Um, in terms of the level of consent, um, Councillor Spence, we don't have quite such um, sophisticated uh, information at the moment but we will be when the um when the system comes on stream so we we do think consent is fairly high um we know schools work very hard to get consent um and that i'm averaging roughly about 70 percent but at the moment that's a, an anticipated um uh, 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 view on on the level of consent in some schools it's higher than that um schools are reporting testing for a system that we have supported called the one system we have made that available to schools free of charge it's very easy for schools and families to put their test results on there. 
once um, that system is more embedded, it was only rolled out late last week, we will be then able to monitor, um, uh, clearly monitor detailed levels of consent going forward. So it, it's not quite as detailed as I would like at the moment, Council Spencer, at the moment there are no concerns being raised or recorded with us. Thanks, Claire. Now, uh, are there any well, urgent Mark questions? Mark Carroll has his hand up. Sorry, Mark, sorry Peter? Uh, Mark Carroll has his hand up. Uh, Mark, uh, I, and then after you, Mark, I wonder, Susanna, as Mike's mentioned vaccinations, could you maybe just say a few words to your paper and Mike will come back to you about public health priorities after that. So, Mark. Uh, thank, thanks very much. Uh, and, and Mike and I are having two dis discussions about two things. Uh, the first is um, European decisions around AstraZeneca vaccine and how that might undermine confidence here. And I think for, for the Health and Wellbeing Board, for colleagues to really think about how they communicate our view about the safety of that vaccine, because um, people will be very anxious as they see it overseas. So I think, you know, I think it's a really important role for Health and Wellbeing Boards, but for individuals on the Health and Wellbeing Board to give very clear uh, guidance uh, and encouragement to people around that vaccine. Um, the second is takes on what you were saying, John, about testing, but, but more broadly, as we get past June, people will start to feel like the world has returned in many ways to normal. And the way in which we communicate with people will have to go with the grain of that. Uh, so we've started talking about harm minimization on prevention, that sense in which we will need to ensure that what we do and our messages don't just bounce off people, but actually enables them to do the things they want to be able to do and carry on doing. As restrictions go, it changes the nature of our communications. We're going to have to work very hard with colleagues, I think, on how do we really communicate in ways that are meaningful to people rather than just telling them not to do things that they won't actually pay attention to or won't hear. Thanks, Mark. Yes, I take that point. Mike, did you just want to say anything about the undermining of confidence piece? And then I'd like to bring Suzanne in on vaccinations. Yeah, I, so I, I think we the, the messages from this country have been extremely strong and extremely positive uh, and extremely clear about this. Um, I, I do think we have to watch whether or not people are, uh, and NHS colleagues may know whether or not people are questioning which vaccine they get and that at the moment. But I think that the, the, the evidence is absolutely clear that the, the number of, uh, of cases uh, that, that have been seen uh, are, are less, actually less than you expect in the general population and are no different between the two um, sorts of vaccine we're seeing in this country. We've given more of this vaccine in this country than anywhere else um, and have very robust mechanisms for identifying any problems that arise from it. So I think um, I don't think this is a real issue. I think it could potentially undermine confidence, but I think we just have to be very clear about our messages and very positive about um, that and clear about the evidence that, that's underlying this and the reality. Okay. Now, as ever in these meetings, I need to keep moving along. But Susanna, rather than talk to the brilliant work that your paper reflects having been done, I think what we should really be focusing on is how, therefore, do we get to these hard to reach people? Um, it will typify my relationship with Dr. Gogarty uh, that when on uh, uh, Monday in a meeting, I said in a tone of pleasure that we had over 95% penetration over the over 70s and, 80, and over 80s. I was shot down by Mike in flames, who said, you might be happy about 95, I'm worried about the other five. Uh, so Susanna, on that note, Okay, thank you, Chair. So um, the paper that um, you have in front of you provides an overview of the work that we're doing around um, equalities and to address health inequalities around the vaccination programme. Um, and as you very correctly say, this is about um, being very concerned about um, ensuring comprehensive uptake of the vaccine um, across all of our communities um, in Essex. Um, the starting point for this, of course, has to be recognition that um, with COVID generally, we already know, and it's well established that health inequalities have simply been amplified um, in the pandemic. So from the very outset of the vaccination programme, um, we sought to um, develop a very comprehensive equalities and health inequalities impact assessment. And that impact assessment has been shared across Suffolk and North East Essex and Mid and South Essex. So um, it's an incredibly um, uh, detailed document and it needs to be as detailed as that, because what we are beginning to see is that there are issues across multiple um, different groups um, in relation to vaccine uptake. 
So we've developed a um, plan um, around um, addressing the various issues that are identified in the Equalities Impact Assessment, which has a number of features. The first is to ensure that um, we have a baseline of reasonable adaptations across all of our vaccination centres in Essex. So we've done that by providing um, an, an equalities checklist, which is integrated into the clinical and quality assurance process for vaccination centres. Also providing advice for staff and volunteers in multiple formats. And then also making sure that we've um, gathered together the broad range of support and um, uh, uh, information that's available um, to the public and um, distributing that alongside information about the vaccine for those passing through the vaccination centres. The second thing has been around um, uh, a multifaceted approach to public engagement and communication. So very early on, um, we identified the need to have a sort of single, cent a single source of information about the vaccination programme um, for the community. So we have two um, vaccination websites. There is one for Suffolk and North East Essex, but the one for um, uh, uh, the Essex COVID vaccine website actually covers the greater Essex footprint and is accessible to the whole population. And um, we've had 17,000 users access the site over the last few months. What that does is it brings together a range of practical information, but also information in a variety of um, uh, accessible formats, things like easy read, translated materials and so on, that enables others to um, support people in terms of discussions about the vaccination programme. Um, it's also really important to have more dynamic feedback and discussions with the public and that's been done across both um, systems through regular online community events where people have been able to ask questions of experts and also through patient experience surveys. So Healthwatch Essex have recently launched a patient experience survey in, um, in Suffolk and North East Essex. The CCG also runs a parallel patient experience survey as well, which has had around about 3000 responses so far. And then it's about feeding back the issues that the public are flagging up in those patient experience surveys and feeding that back into the vaccination program through the routes that I've mentioned to make sure the issues are addressed. We have been looking in particular at the issue of reticence, and this has been quite a moving target. In the very early outset, um, we um, sought to understand emerging evidence that there was hesitancy perhaps within our BAME communities. But as things have moved forward, it looks as if um, uh, there's actually a much broader range of issues um, uh, which we need to consider. So, for example, a survey of care home providers where we looked at reticence amongst some care home staff who had not accepted the vaccine revealed that it was actually predominantly younger women who had um, concerns about taking the vaccine based on issues around pregnancy and fertility. And we've been responding to those. We've also been looking at um, issues in terms of um, access to vaccinations of carers. Um, and people with learning disabilities and people who, for various reasons, would like to access the vaccination process with perhaps some um, specific adjustments for their particular needs. Um, uh, we've also done some things like online um, uh, 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 trusted communicator programmes and community role model um, uh, campaigns as well, which have appeared in, in social media. Then in terms of broadening access to the vaccination um, pro uh, programme, we're seeking to do this in a range of ways. We do have some ability, obviously, to provide mobile delivery of vaccinations perhaps, um, by GPs to those who are housebound or in care homes. But we've also started to experiment with, with operating specialist clinics that are able to include a whole range of adaptations for particular groups. For, so, for example, for people with learning disabilities. And we've also co-produced some specialist clinics with specific faith groups or um, perhaps with women's organisations to um, reassure those coming forward for vaccination that all of their needs are going to be met and that they don't need to have any concerns in terms of um, uh, some of the things that they might have heard um, are issues um, with um, the general process. Um, and then lastly, there's various models emerging for outreach models of vaccine delivery. Um, so, for example, partnering with Ford to develop plans uh, for outreach vehicles to support mobile vaccinations uh, in Mid and South Essex. This morning, uh, myself and Mike Gogarty were talking about um, whether or not the SOS best was being used in North East Essex, which it is, to support mobile vaccinations. 
The pilot um, co-produced clinics are, um, have definitely um, revealed um, that they can make a real impact in terms of addressing the needs of specific communities. Um, we had a real drive in North East Essex in terms of engaging the Bangladeshi community and those, um, the congregation of the local mosque. And we can see an uptick in the data in terms of the uptake of the va vaccine quite remarkably. It's quite responsive. If you look at the graph on the page, top of page 38, you'll see the trend um, up until we started that process in around about mid-February and how the rate of uptake of the vaccine had um, improved since then. In terms of reaching those from marginalised and vulnerable groups, so um, people who are homeless, um, the Roma community, migrant workers, gypsies and travellers, ex-offenders, sex workers and asylum seekers and refugees, we're using a combination of support from the existing health outreach service who already have experience and relationships working with those communities across both Essex and Suffolk, and also um, we're combining this with other forms of um, adapted specialist clinics and co-producing perhaps with, um, for example, the Colchester um, Refugee Action Organisation who brought forward a number of people uh, for vaccine with some specific adaptations, including, for example, making sure that we're able to um, register those who do not have an NHS number. Lastly, what I'd like to just mention is that as the vaccine programmes move forward, we increasingly have access to data around vaccine uptake. Um, some of the latest um, uh, 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 ways in which that data is presented. So for example, I've given a, a snapshot of, of the way that we can see data on a geographical mapping basis um, for using something called Foundry. This is um, becoming increasingly available. It's available to all systems, provides a really useful way to start to look locally at vaccine uptake and then to think about how we can bring together all of those different options in terms of um, engaging with different groups and communities. The very last thing I want to mention is that an issue that pre-existed um, the vaccination programme, but has certainly been um, a feature as we've worked through um, this, this work to date, has been um, the um, problems with accuracy of recording of ethnicity in people's health records. So we're using this opportunity to try to um, um, systematically um, uh, record people's ethnicities in, in more accurately on their healthcare records through this process. So um, we've provided um, some tools to do that out to vaccination centres and we're hoping that this will um, lead to better recording of ethnicity, which will also help us to look at some of those health inequalities going forward. Thank no, you. That ex excellent. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, uh, Peter, are there any hands up at this stage? There are, there are three hands up so far. Um, uh, in order, they are Councillor Mark Corey, then Mike Gogarty, then Paul Burstow. So I'll go with Mark, then Paul, then Mike. Mike, I'll probably leave you a bit, but Mark, Corey. Thank you. Uh, just a really small point. When I've used a, a lateral flow test centre and a PCR centre, I've not seen any posters or any communication about the vaccine at these places. I just think that's a missed opportunity when you're standing in a queue um, you're already doing the right thing by testing. It's probably likely you'll go on to get the vaccination. But I just thought, um, especially when I was at Colchester Leisure World, we, I, I saw a number of different communities represented there and ethnicities. And in order to tackle some of those problems we've talked about, I just thought you're waiting, you're there for at least 10 minutes or so. Let's get some propaganda into those places too. Thanks, Mark. I'll get Mike to respond to that later. Paul, I, I'm conscious, Paul, that a lot of what Susanna said in the we there was about Mid-South and North-East Essex, but I'm guessing you would say there's parallels going on in West Essex. Yes, I'm, I'm pleased the items on the agenda and obviously uh, from your perspective, you, you want to have an Essex wide lens and entirely understand that. So let me just add a, a little bit of colour from uh, the, the, the West Essex uh, and uh, Hertfordshire and West Essex system perspective as well. Um, we have uh, developed an inequalities action plan um, very much uh, targeted at uh, vulnerable and uh, hard to reach uh, groups. Um, we've got some really good practice, I think, developed around approaches of working alongside Roma and Gypsy communities and have seen some really high levels of participation when uh, that's been delivered in an outreach way. Um, I think we've seen across the patch uh, between 83 and 84% of our uh, learning disability population now having received uh, the vaccine. I think there's some, some interesting, more granular uh, data coming out of uh, analyzing the middle layer super output areas. And I've only just learned what that meant when I saw the, the ML 
SO uh, piece earlier on today. I wanted to be certain I had that right, uh, which covers about two or three uh, wards at a time. And what that allows you to do is really look quite uh, in, in quite close detail at uh, the variation uh, against uh, various indices, not least deprivation, which I think, again, is a way of refining and targeting uh, the efforts in terms of where you want to deliver messages uh, and so on. Um, and I think probably a more general point, which speaks to Susanna's point about uh, uh, immigrant uh, populations, particularly perhaps undocumented uh, migrant populations, um, the fact that the Home Office has said that it won't be um, using uh, the registration with GPs to have access to the vaccination program uh, is, I think, an important message which needs to be widely uh, circulated but obviously also plays into the other issue, those that do not have an NHS number and how we make sure that we're taking steps to uh, uh, increase the, uh, the numbers of people who actually are registered in one way or another so they can, be, can, can access uh, these services. I think the final thing to say is that we also are working in partnership with COVID champions in the community to increase uptake as well. So I think a lot of parallels with what Suzanne said, um, but also I think probably some opportunities for cross fertilization, which I think is taking place at, a, at a, a, an officer level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Any other hands up, Peter, before I go back to Mike? Uh, Joe Cripps. Uh, Joe, and then I'll come back to you, Mike. Joe? Thanks, John. So just briefly, and kind of illustrating Susanna's point about how partners are working together to try to reach seldom heard communities. We've had a uh, an example in South End around the homeless population where we brought together services from Adam Brooks to, to vaccinate Hep B, um, Hep C, sorry, and, uh, and COVID vaccinations and managed to bring together kind of 90 of our homeless community and vaccinate them. So there's real partnership working using the data, using the health inequalities assessment process to really target and reach communities that we wouldn't normally be able to. So it's just an illustration. And on that point, Joe, I would want this board to minute our appreciation of all the volunteers who have stepped up to help with the vaccination programme and all those who have been recruiting those volunteers, including the GPs on the call, uh, but all the GPs of Essex, the district, borough, city councils, county council, uh, the CBSs, everybody who has been involved in bringing this entire volunteer force for such a sustained period. You know, it, it is not a short, sharp piece. We know that this effort's going to be going on for months. Mike, can I ask you to respond and then please talk very briefly to what you want out of your priorities for public health, please. Um, thank you. So, um, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the work that um, Susanna, Joe uh, and colleagues in West doing that Paul mentioned is fantastic and absolutely critical because you really have to make sure that those most um, excluded, those are most at risk of not getting vaccinated, get the vaccine. But as Councillor Spence <laughs> said at the start, um, I'm kind of interested in the 5%. So if I just broadly look at the um, the position in, in and, and it's just the first data I saw, North East Essex, clinically extremely vulnerable. There are 1,700 in that group who have not yet been vaccinated in North East Essex, of which 200 are in the groups we've been talking about. 1,500 of the 1,700 are not. They are just people. So um, what I think is really, really critical is that we absolutely understand why each of those individuals has not been vaccinated and then get them into a place where they feel able to get vaccinated and we can support them in doing so. The only way to do that is to contact them individually and the only ways to do that is through the GP practices and then through our um, Essex Wellbeing Service, which we've agreed to do. Um, I've spoken to um, colleagues, uh, uh, the um, GP leads in each of these CCG areas. I've spoken to um, Dr. Barmer, who I'm delighted is on the call today. Um, I'm really keen that we make this happen. It started in some areas. There was a great meeting yesterday, uh, Joe, with colleagues in, in Basildon who are, are taking this on. There's been um, an agreement we do it in West Essex, been an agreement we do it in, uh, in, in um, Castle Point as well. Um, but I just don't think it's happening quick enough. So I'd really welcome colleagues' views on how we can step it up, because actually the ones I'm most worried about are the ones who are in those groups and haven't been vaccinated. So the uh, the, the, the over 80s, the 70s to 74s, and the whole host of reasons for that, which we can get on top of. And I know practices are chasing them up, but we do offer the support to, to enable that to happen. Um, finally, yeah, Mike. If, finally, if we have um, those who are uh, clinics extremely vulnerable uh, if it is problematic for the gps to do that we have those lists and what i don't want to do is trip over what primary care colleagues are doing 
But as I said, there are 1,500 in North East Essex alone who have not been vaccinated. We could use our systems within the Essex Wellbeing Service to contact them and talk through the opportunities with them. Um, uh, we'd have to call them all because we don't know the ones that haven't been vaccinated, but we have a relationship with them because we've been working with them already. So one of the suggestions for colleagues here, if it would fit with what GP colleagues, primary care colleagues are doing, would be that we could actually use the Essex Wellbeing Service to contact those who are clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, now, frankly, um, I'll be right. hand up and has been doing some great work on this in Basildon. It was that Boyer, did you say, Mike? Yeah. Okay, Boyer, good morning. Good morning. I think I've been, I've dropped off the connection and I've come back again, so I've probably missed quite a few of what has been said. Um, I'm sorry, but I think you were just receiving praise from Mike uh, Gogarty there, Bob. Oh, OK. <laughs> I know you guys in Baslin met with um, uh, colleagues yesterday about um, us uh, supporting you to just find those ones who haven't been. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Bob. Uh, is there any reaction to what Mike said from any of the GPs? And uh, One of the challenges I always face in these meetings is, is that the same people keep talking at such length, I never get the chance to bring other people in. So whether any of the, the GPs, you're being offered help and support there, um, which I leave you to note, but do you have any things you want to say to us? Two hands so, up, uh, Sunil Gupta uh, and Andrew Sheldon. Uh, uh, who was the first one, Peter? Uh, Sunil Gupta. Sunil. Hi, so Mike, I really welcome that offer of help and would like to work very closely to take that forward. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let's uh, pick that up offline. Andrew, you're not a GP, but you're very welcome to say something. Thank you very much, John. Um, can I just 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 um, support uh, Mike's comments about the Essex Wellbeing Service, particularly their their online social media reach? I think in those communities um, where they've got very good penetration, such as in Castlepoint and Cambria, I think perhaps they could be encouraged uh, via social media to um, do a. Really but like a ground company check on your neighbour, something like that. It'd be good to see those kind of messages coming out in the Essex Wellbeing Service while the Essex Coronavirus Action Group. Okay, you've got, some very bad message. you've got some very bad background interference there, Andrew. I think you've got a kettle whistling or something, but I got the message uh, and absolutely about the Wellbeing Service. Any other hands up, Peter, before we move on? Uh, Hassan has his hand up. Hassan? Uh, just, just a quick note. Uh, just um, so thanks, Mike. I mean, nobody's ever going to turn down any help, and, and you know, as a practice that has volunteers come and stand out in the freezing cold, you know, it's amazing to see. So, all help welcome to contact these patients. But um, the only thing I point I wanted to make is is that um, sometimes there's a bit of a discrepancy in these figures, and so, so we do find that there's there's delays in updating, yeah. um, and and anyone who's willing to call is most welcome because we do find we're now at the point where we sometimes get quite a lot of aggression from patients because of three or four people trying to phone them they've already booked it somewhere and because of the way that we're doing the clinical systems and the, and the massive variety and locations that people can go to um, sometimes it's just quite difficult to know whether somebody's actually had an appointment booked so so so, so anyone who's willing to, to phone and take some of the flack from patients for being called for the 10th time uh, most welcome thank you no, thanks Hassan so Mike we, uh, we're already miles behind time but it's been a great discussion thank you Mike, you've got two actions, please. Firstly, the consideration of vaccination posters and publicity at testing centres, both where people are getting tests or collecting tests. That's an action for you. And the second action is to reach out to all the GPs as the CCG chairs in the room uh, to um, sort out exactly how support from the Essex Wellbeing Service for our wonderful GPs will work. OK, Mike? Thank you. Thank you. So now you wanted to just get some feedback that in the light of COVID, what should the highest priorities be for public health? Can I invite you to speak very briefly to your paper, please, Mike? Um, thank you. Yeah, I will be brief. Um, I assume people have seen it. So there's been a number of challenges um, for, for us in terms of public health. The, the ones that I would mention, uh, and we would need to catch on the health checks, which is very much um, fallen by the wayside and we will need to pick up on. Um, sexual health, there's been lots of discussion only this morning about increased levels of teenage pregnancy that may be occurring, which we need to understand more about. Um, it may be that young people are less uh, able to access uh, support from primary care. It may be that they're, um, they're frightened about coming forward for post-contraception um, uh, post because they um, 
they, they feel they've done wrong by going out. Um, th th we've had issues around substance abuse, particularly, uh, as you can see from the paper, very high uh, levels of um, people support re requesting alcohol treatment. And I suspect that that is um, the tip of an iceberg. Um, uh, issues in terms of weight management, we know everyone's been sitting at home. Um, and uh, physical activity as well, which, which we will uh, have a separate paper on and discussion on later. Um, so they're the areas that I think are most important, but um, I welcome colleagues' discussions and comments. Thanks, Mike. We will indeed come back to physical activity later, but uh, among the other areas, and I really would, we would benefit from the medical expertise on the call if you told us from your insights, whether you as GPs or you from the acute hospitals, could give us a clue of where you think our, if our colleagues from EPRIT have joined us, they may have something that public health can be doing. He's just had his grant confirmed for next year, haven't you, Mike? So, I uh, certainly have, yeah. Right, this is the time for us to prioritise that spend. Peter, anybody got their hands up? There's no hands up currently showing. Uh, I am going to then... Uh, unless uh, Neil Gupta has his hand up, sorry. Uh, Neil, thank goodness somebody came to the rescue. So, Neil. The one the priorities I'd like to see emphasise more is increasing exercise, because that'll help both weight loss, reducing the risk of diabetes and improving mental health. Uh, well, absolutely coming back to that later in the agenda, Sunil. Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I, I always understand who the boss in this relationship is, uh, and I'll, I'll share with you later what Mike said to me. Are there any other hands, Peter? Uh, Nick Hume and then Andrew Sheldon. Great to hear from you. And Nick, I'd just love to hear from you while you're on, just what the state is in the hospitals now in terms of what you are how much of your normal capacity for non-COVID stuff you're back up to. So just while I've got you there, I'd like to hear on that. But uh, on the public health piece, Nick. So just on the public health, uh, I think, Chair, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to, I would suggest, to predict at the moment, because what we don't know yet are the impact of two things. Firstly, the impact of people staying away effectively from all access to healthcare, whether that's primary, uh, or secondary care for effectively the last 12 months. I think we've all seen, uh, to various degrees, a reduction in demand, in a sense, whether that's pent-up demand that's there that we're going to see later in the year, or whether that's uh, demand that for whatever reason. So if you look at paediatrics, I think nationally there's been a 40% reduction in paediatric attendance to ED. Uh, and we think that's probably because kids haven't been playing, haven't been playing sport, haven't been mixing with each other. Uh, no RSV, for example, this, this winter. The other impact is because uh, many services have been diverted, for example, towards vaccination. What we they, again don't know is because whether or not that's had an impact on access. One of the things that I've been asking locally, regionally, and indeed nationally is the assurance around things like, for example, cervical screening and other screening programmes, because the GPs absolutely right have been concentrating on on the vaccination programme more recently. So I think we'll see emerging issues over the next 12, 18, 24 months that we need to be responding to very quickly. Uh, and therefore, in terms of setting priorities, my question is how much flexibility will we have in year? We're seeing a big increase in stage three and stage four cancer presenting through ED rather than being picked up earlier down the line and therefore having an impact on, on prognosis. So, so a bit of flexibility in setting those priorities, I think, would be helpful. In terms of us getting back to um, the new normal, we're not allowed to talk about the old normal, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, later, um, is, is uh, I think we're about 88% of our outpatient um, uh, uh, follow-ups and 94% of our outpatient news. Um, uh, across ESNEF, so that would include the, the, the Suffolk site uh, as well. Um, and um, in terms of our operating, we've always maintained our most urgent, our known as P2 activity throughout the entire year, so that hasn't been impacted. And we're at about 60% of, uh, of, uh, of, of our overall elective activity at the moment, but that is increasing by a significant percentage literally on a day-by-day -day basis so we're we're well, well on the right way to having sufficient capacity open to deal with to start to deal with the unprecedented backlog that we're going to face over the next well probably for the rest of my career john uh, which hopefully will be many years 
I hope to be many people years. Wait, slowly. Not Thank the people have been much. waiting many years, but the my career will be on many years on the basis. So I haven't been caught yet. Yeah, well, well said, but I'll be all hope you stay around for a long time. I, I, I take the point about too early to say, um, and of course, Mike, we would flex during the year. We just need to, we just want to try and make sure we're focusing on the right things in the very short term. So uh, we know we're going to do physical activity, we'll come back to, but other thoughts will be welcome, unless there's any other hands up, Peter. There are, we've got uh, Andrew Sheldon and then Nick Presmeg. Okay. Uh, I'll take Andrew, then Nick, in that order, then Andrew. Um, and I will be brief, simply to support um, precisely what, what Nick has just said. I think there is a lot of pent-up demand there, particularly around investigation of what would otherwise be quite minor complaints. People have been keeping away from the GP surgeries. I think there's an opportunity there, number one, I think, to do a, a, a comms piece around um, uh, around kind of what to do in the event of those kind of, you, you having those complaints. But also it might be an opportunity to perhaps... I suppose, re-educate um, the public about um, what concerns you should go to with your, your local pharmacist as well as your GP to make sure that they're not um, massively, over, the GP's surgery is not massively overwhelmed once we uh, once the lockdown restrictions are lifted. Thanks, Andrew. You're absolutely right. We mustn't stray into NHS territory. Uh, this was very much about seeking priorities for our public health function, but uh, absolutely right. Nick? Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, in terms of public health priorities, I, I would suggest that we also start to think not just about those things we've fallen behind on, but those things that we weren't doing well enough in the first place. And I'm thinking specifically about our uh, strategy and capability an action plan for population health management. We had an excellent presentation at the uh, MSE um, STP yesterday from Dr. Ronan Fenton and Joe Broadbent, highlighting exactly what could be done in that space that determines health outcomes in the 80% of the things that the NHS doesn't directly influence through its spend. And it's quite clear our capability isn't what it should be, and our plans aren't as effective as they could be. So I would have an appeal that we're not just catching up, but we're building a better future capability, John. Thanks, Nick. And again, we're coming back to population health management. I too have seen that presentation, uh, Nick. It's, uh, it's terrific, actually. Uh, Mike, you've not had much feedback there. I would ask all members, John, please. Got, uh, Jane Halpin has got a hand up as well now, sorry. I'm really going to have to move on, Peter, though. So Jane, could you just be, we're about 20 minutes behind now. So Jane? Yeah, um, just very, very briefly, John, I um, just wanted to um, s suggest something around mental health promotion uh, being captured. Uh, it feels like it's it's missing and there's such a pent up demand. That was all I was going to say. Yeah, well, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you'll, I'll let you in, Jane. Thank you. Uh, members will have received a note from me yesterday. Uh, the subgroup of this board that plan future agendas have asked that our next uh, meeting in May be on the issue of mental health uh, and uh, both the state of it uh, and the piece I've asked for a scoping paper to be prepared and agreed with you all. Uh, we will be having an additional short meeting in April. So that April will be a formal meeting of this board, um, but the uh, I want to move into much more of a workshop mode on uh, mental health in May, but you've seen the note. So thanks, Jane, for that. Uh, Mike, any last comment? And it's going to be quick, Mike. Um, yeah, just I, I'm not sure about the um, uh, next comment and um, health management because it's about doing things and delivering for the population. But let's let's uh, uh, discuss that when we when we need to and make sure we get it right. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm I'm very comfortable. I absolutely agree with mental health as an issue. Absolutely agree with physical activity as an issue. Um, so yeah, let let yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. All right, Mike, thanks. Would you mind uh, uh, each of the officers from the ICSs, if I could ask you just to take about one minute or two minutes each? I would like Tom Abel just to get a view from you on the acute hospitals after that, before we move on with the rest of the agenda. So I'm, I'm sorry to do this to you all, but Jane, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, ha ha happy to. Uh, in, in terms of just sort of he headlines, uh, particularly in, in, in West Essex, obviously, Princess Alex has been one of the hospitals that's had uh, quite significant demand over the last couple of months, um, is now coming back towards 
uh, towards more normal levels of, of, of service. Um, we've got some concerns about restoring rapidly some aspects of, of, of service. Um, I think theatres have been particularly um, uh, impaired, but, but good work going on there and, and good cross-sector work going on uh, to, to look at all areas of, of, of service uh, restoration. Uh, Paul's touched on some of the, uh, the, the inequalities uh, aspects uh, of work we're doing with COVID vaccination, but COVID vaccination generally uh, going very well. Um, and uh, the areas where we've been focused on, particularly in terms of uh, catching up on, on more uh, hard to reach groups, particularly uh, some of the areas in Epping, some of the areas in, in, in Loughton. So um, that's probably in, enough to say, John, uh, conscious of, of time, but uh, happy to, to, to answer any specifics if, if they're in people's minds. Thanks very much, Jane. Thanks for your help. Uh, Jill from Midland South. Yeah, so very briefly, John and Tom will talk a bit about the hospital pressures. Um, you've heard about our vaccine programme, so we've, we've vaccinated over 400,000 people in Mid and South Essex, about 1.2 million population. Um, lots of work going on around health inequalities that you've heard about. In terms of our kind of general ICS, our application for integrated care system status was considered by the NHS England national team yesterday, and we await an outcome from that. Hopefully that will be a positive outcome. Um, we had our board yesterday, um, as you heard from Nick, we had a really good presentation around our population health management program from Roman Fenton. That's progressing well. Um, we've also doing a, a bit of work to kind of prepare for white paper implementation. So what that means for our system, looking at our partnership MOU, agreeing the kind of CCG transition arrangement, system operating budgets, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, we've done, had some really good work working with Kirsty around the building on the Facebook um, community interaction and engagement. So we've got a program called This Is Your Life and we've reached over a million people on that, which has been fantastic. So we'll continue to build that work. It's very much been a kind of broadcast mechanism up until now due to the COVID, uh, you know, needing to kind of engage with, with public on a one-way channel, if you like. What we want to do now is develop that in a, it very much in a two-way engagement programme. Um, and then uh, just to close, we had a really good presentation from our CBS colleagues yesterday at our board and certainly lots of opportunities to work more closely with them, both at system level and through our four places. So I'll, I'll leave it there, John. I'm happy to answer. Very that. interesting, Joe. Thanks. So as we're with Mid and South, uh, Tom, do you want to give a quick word from the hospitals? Yeah, happy to, uh, John. So um, similar to the, the positions in, in, in the other hospitals in the county, um, so we've seen a significant and steady reduction in the number of COVID cases within the, within the trust. So we, we peaked at around about 900. We've now got about 100 confirmed COVID cases within the hospital, and we've seen a consequential reduction also in critical care demand, which has been really helpful. So we've been able to restart some of our so that uh, P, what we call our P2, so not quite the absolute life-saving, but still very clinically urgent cases that require critical care backup. So that works restarting. Um, we're now plugging through the hard work of how do we um, how do we start to restore services and what is going to be our plan in terms of being able to tackle obviously the the, the significant waiting list that have built up that I think kind of Nick referred to earlier. I think a big component's got to be a system-wide response to that because I think if we're going to want to sustainably get on top of this we're going to need to look at new ways of operating and new forms of treatment and support that we can provide to local communities other than hospital care in order to free up the capacity that we're going to need to create for those patients who the hospital is their only option if that makes sense and so that that's a piece of work which we're doing with Joe and other colleagues in the, in the Middle and South Pacific system at the moment to try and work on what some of those options might be that's helpful. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'll come to Susanna and then I'll see if there's any questions for Tom or for anybody else. Susanna? So, um, our vaccination rollout um, obviously continues. We're very pleased, in particular, with the progress in North East Essex. You've already heard about the work that we're doing around um, the equalities aspects of that. We're beginning to look to the next steps in terms of things like words begin with our recovery, reset, restoration. Um, and um, our board has agreed that we need to um, run in parallel with that a more reflective piece around system learning, um, which we're framing around a very simple question, which is how do we heal um, going forward? So that's going to be a bit of a theme for our conversations over the next couple of months. 
Um, another R word is response. And um, in terms of COVID response, the focus that we're looking at now with a joint project with ESNEFT and also support from Essex Welfare Service is supporting those who are now waiting for treatment and really starting to think about how we can um, make sure that we think about all of the various challenges that are faced by that group who have been um, indirectly impacted, of course, by COVID. Um, the commitment to um, health equality um, continues. We're re-establishing our series of Thinking Differently um, conversations this afternoon with a focused conversation around um, really um, pushing forward with the work around our anchor um, program around social value and particularly social entrepreneurs. And we're going to be announcing this afternoon a project with some funding to accelerate um, what we hope is going to be the re-procurement of some NHS contracts for social value and to encourage social entrepreneurs to work more closely with our local NHS organisations. Um, and then last but not least, um, we um, have had an initial conversation about the um, uh, implications of the NHS white paper at our ICS board and are doing some work over the next month to really um, uh, understand the implications and impact of the NHS white paper across all of our stakeholders in the ICS. Thank you very much. And I'm sure everybody would be delighted if I keep away from that topic for this morning. Uh, so, uh, Peter, are there any hands up, please? Anybody want to ask any questions of our Mike ICS partners? Mike Thorne has his hand up. Sorry? Uh, Mike Thorne. Michael? Uh, thanks, John. Just to add to what Tom Abel said, um, there are figures um, which um, compare the sort of COVID burden across the different hospitals in the east of England and Tom's three hospitals you know, at, at a peak, we're covering 40% of the COVID burden. And I think overall, it, it, about 20% of the burden has been with them. And that's almost double the next nearest hospital. So, um, you know, first of all, they should be congratulated on carrying that load without falling over, as it were. Secondly, you know, that's why um, it's going to take longer get back up and running as normal again because of that incredible load that was carried. But I, I would basically congratulate Tom and the hospital colleagues and all the partners that have worked from social care and the voluntary sector to make sure that, you know, things didn't fall over with that kind of load. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, and yes, Tom, uh, the pressures you were under at the turn of the year, I think we all understood. Uh, and uh, but I, you know, I, I would always have to say thanks to all our colleagues across uh, the NHS, the acute hospitals. We just need to look back to the levels of infection we had in Essex in January to understand that we truly were in the eye of a very intense storm. Uh, and uh, to everybody uh, and all my colleagues in social care and the voluntary sector, as you said, Mike, our great thanks, our district council. So it's been a whole system piece, and it's just where this piece about the irreversibility feels to me so important. So uh, let's keep it going cautiously and in a sustained way. I have to move on to a piece of formality. We are required to receive the uh, annual report for 2019-20 on fatalities among learning disabilities. That report has been circulated. We have received no comments. And therefore I ask everyone to agree that this paper be received and noted, which I will take to be agreed. So, Mike, you're going to update us now on this issue around suicide, and I think you have been trying to get some more up-to-date information than 2019. John, we have a hand up from Councillor Peter Davey, sorry. Oh, I tried. Uh, <laughs> Peter Davey? Uh, sorry, John, just to advise the board that the ELC, in conjunction with the CBSU, have completed three of our learning disability awareness training sessions, which are very broad in content, and so far, we have had 30 separate local councillors undertake the training, and it's been very well received to date. Sorry, Peter, what's the training about? Disability training. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Peter. Very good. Well done. Right. Mike, suicide, please. Um, thank you. So um, I'm delighted I got uh, Gemma and Claire, who are the principal authors of the paper, uh, on uh, at the meeting today. So um, welcome to you both. Thank you for all you're doing. 
Um, but um, members will have the chance to, uh, to look through the paper, so I don't intend to go through it in great detail. Um, just uh, a couple of things to say. Sadly, we have had more upstate data, but for, uh, uh, for suicide, that still means stuff that's a couple of years old. But um, the, the poor performance of Essex and the poor performance of those particular districts in Essex continues. Um, so uh, sadly, we haven't seen any real improvements. Um, that the, um, the important next step in terms of getting data um, that there's a real value will be the real time suicide surveillance work, which is ongoing with police at the moment, uh, together with, with county council partners. Um, and I look forward to, to that being the best way to get timely data. Um, we, uh, I spoke as uh, I think Councillor uh, Spence alluded to the coroner's office um, to at least get an anecdotal um, COVID. Um, the sense from that office is that, um, that the COVID um, pandemic has not had a detrimental effect on the levels of suicide, um, that um, they've certainly not seen an increase. Um, however, uh, we've also now got local groups, um, which I think will be good at developing um, a local flavour uh, and a kind of local qualitative uh, uh, understanding of what's going on. But I think we really need the quantitative measures from the real-time suicide surveillance uh, system to really understand what's going on. And most importantly, we need um, wide system buy-in to, uh, to tackle this issue. Uh, and also to, uh, by wide system buy-in, I mean both the partners here, but also um, looking at those wider determinants, those upstream determinants that are driving people into such awful positions where they feel um, that they need to contemplate. Um, okay. to Mike, two questions for me. Firstly, uh, we talk about the real-time surveillance being under development, but there's no date in the paper for when it will come into being. So can you commit today to a date? Secondly, the last time this board discussed the issue of suicide, we commissioned Mike McHugh to go and have an audit with the coroner's office to give us some better clarity about causes, whether, for instance, things might be related to deprivation, to addiction, to work pressures, to relationship breakdown or whatever a simple high level analysis to help understand because the districts involved are not all uh, areas necessarily of high deprivation. So, and I appreciate that's been disrupted, but what are the latest plans for that? So a date for the surveillance and plans for the audit. So I think that the, my, my, I'm, I'll bring colleagues in, I'll bring Claire and Gemma in, um, in terms of the actual date, but I understand it's quite imminent once we've got the understanding and the agreement on term of how we're gonna make it happen. Um, but they'll give a precise date. I also think once we do that, we can look retrospectively through that mechanism rather than the coroner's mechanism. That may give us a more timely snapshot of what's been going on. But Claire or Gemma, can someone of you help us, please? I want to get a date for the real-time surveillance. And if there's a blockage, this is the time for you to tell us when the Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner is on the call. Good morning, Councillor Spence, it's Gemma Andrews. Um, so yes, with regards to the um, real-time surveillance, the, uh, uh, the initial cut of the first um, pull of data should be coming through to us at the end of May. That's the commitment currently given to us by Essex Police. Um, just to be clear on that, that is going to be our first cut. So that's going to be the opportunity for us to look at what that looks like and whether we're happy with that and, and to make those amendments and, the, uh, and get that first, um, first pull of data. Um, what that will also do is scope for us uh, Mike sort of alluded to the potential to do a back a backward look so that we could establish a baseline within the, the police data set as well. Um, so that that is for the end of May, um, obviously dependent on the on, on that coming from the police. Um, and then moving forwards from that, there is a phase to just to make you aware, there's also a phased um, programme where, whereby we're looking at pulling additional data sets um, on top of the police data. But that very first one will be available from the end of May, I've been assured this week. Um, we, is it also prudent to come and uh, come to the audit data? So in terms of the audit data, we have been in and we have completed um, that, that audit um, with the coroner's office um, and a paper will be available by the next Health and Be Health Wellbeing Board in order to look at um, the limitations of that data, because what has become abundantly clear is that um, it isn't able to provide us with the level of robust data that we would like in order to make those um, causal links, Councillor Spence, that, that, you, that you reference. Um, and therefore, obviously, we want to address that within our future data collection through real-time surveillance. So obviously um, having that information uh, available will help for us to have that backward look, but it's not been as an informative around causality as we would have hoped because the minimum data set from the coroner is not standardised across all cases. Um, so it, it's not providing the level of data that we would want despite having gone in and actually 
um, interrogated it. So it, it obviously leads us firmly into why real-time surveillance will be even more important in understanding um, what's going on in terms of the composition of those people completing suicide. Because what I would mention is that although we're not anticipating there being um, increased levels of suicide relating to COVID at the moment based on the coroner's uh, evidence, but also based on the national picture, um, we don't have the information on the composition of those individuals completing suicide and whether there's a disproportionately um, different range of people being impacted at this time. So obviously that's what we're aiming to achieve through these changes in data collection. Okay, I do find that, Gemma, thanks very much. Uh, the, the messengers always don't shoot the messenger. And, and thank you for uh, delivering that, set, that, that news in a graceful way. But I, I find it so perplexing when we are clearly, as a county, at the very worst end of performance on this issue for how to population. Uh, and we see the, that we have three of our districts in the top four or five nationally. So there we are. But thanks, Gemma, and thanks for all that you're doing on it. Uh, Peter, are there hands up on there this are, There are three hands up. So uh, in order, it was Councillor John Moran, then Ian Davidson, then Nick Hume. I'm uh, going to take the outsiders, please, John, if you don't mind. So I'll come to Ian, then Nick, and then to John. Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, and, you know, this is a, a, a paper which um, is very close to my heart, and okay. we've discussed this on a number of occasions. So uh, I've saved um, taking up any time on other items because I wanted to keep it for this one. Um, in terms of this paper, th there's a number of things. But first of all, thank you, Mike, at short notice in your team, bringing that together um, as ever. Um, uh, brilliant. Um, I think that some of the issues which Gemma has raised just still may not get us to the level of a real understanding. And I think you touched on that, John, is, is why in Essex, whether it be deprivation or other areas of England are deprived, Coastal. Well, we've got other areas of, it, of England which have coastal, and obviously not all of ours are, are coastal either. Um, and so I think the granularity is not just about the individual causes, but, our, but also what are some of the trends, what are some of the linkages. So understanding that at a, at a level of is there something within Essex which we are doing or not doing which others are doing, or which is you know the challenge to ourselves. Is it because of other, other determinants? But I think that we need to get to that level of granularity of understanding, as Gemma said, the the some of those causes and what the ind what the individuals um, reasons have been. But then putting that together and it may well be that we need to actually do a piece of work with families behind um, the scene, um, which is obviously very sensitive to really understand why in a deprived area in Essex is happening, but more so in the in Essex than in some uh, you know Liverpool or in some of the more deprived areas in the north um, so I really am struggling to understand that but I would like to understand for example tendering as a figure one of the first things I want to understand is is it tendering wide or is it Harwich which is worse or Clacton which is worse so there's 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 tiers of information which we really need to get, get involved with I, I, I would like to suggest and Mike is absolutely on this with having the local the local um, boards the local groups which are looking on this um, and I, I would suggest that you know we, we do need to once we start drawing that together to have some sort of some sort of group which is for Essex to working group for Essex which brings this together to actually be able to compare what's the Harlow group finding compared to what's the tendering group finding and so on and so forth. So I'm very happy to instigate or work with Mike on that if that's helpful. But I really do think we need to really understand and get this. And John, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said, why is it worse in Essex when all those other determinants are across the U in other parts of the UK? Ian, wherever we are, whether I'm in G, we're care at Saffron Ward and our minds think totally alike. Thank you. Uh, Nick? Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose it, it's a reflection really in terms of, of, of where we are um, in answer to, to Ian's point. I mean, I think that there's, uh, anyway, um, so sorry, I lost my thought there a little bit. So I think the, my question would be really to, to, to Mike and colleagues about whether or not we've looked beyond Essex, because when you look at the zero suicide alliances in the Northwest, particularly, um, I did some work a couple of years ago in, in, with all the places in, in Detroit, looking at zero suicides and whatever face we face in Northeast Essex, Detroit, uh, we pale into insignificance in terms of the social challenges in Detroit, and yet they've had significant success in, in getting very close to zero suicides. So 
have we looked nationally and indeed internationally at the zero suicide alliances which are developing because we could be in danger of reinventing a, an all, already well-established wheel. Thank you, Nick. Very fair. John Moran. I may have misread the paper. I couldn't see Athelsford mentioned at all in it. Um, and I know of at least four uh, men who've taken their lives in my area in the last um, year or so. You need to remember this is the data for 2019. That's the problem, John. Yeah, I still... But, but your, your point's made. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's, there's no mention of Athelsford. Your point's made. Um, uh, well done, thanks. Any other hands up, Peter? There are uh, two more. Uh, we've got a uh, uh, boy, Teo, and then uh, Sue Wadhouse. So, uh, can I bring Sue in as we've not heard from you, Sue, and then Boyo? Thank you, Chair. Um, there's been a lot of work that's been done nationally around this. There's a national strategy around suicide that looked at patterns um, uh, led by Lewis Appleby at one point, and I think it'd be worth looking looking to that. So some areas that have been really effective have been areas that have tackled hotspot areas. Um, so, for example, I actually live in Sussex near Beachy Head, which was, you know, the hotspot capital of the world. And um, there was a lot of work done. And interestingly, um, if it, it, times in winter when Beachy Head was less accessible, suicide rates dropped and they didn't manifest elsewhere. So it's very much around um, removing the accessibility. So I think as, uh, across Essex, it would be worth looking at some of these initiatives and, and looking at ways of tackling if there's hotspot areas, as well as the causes. So, you know, the underlying he mental health issues, okay. et cetera. Thank you, Sue, absolutely fair. Uh, Boyer? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this, uh, for the presentation, which is, um kind of sober reading. I was going to follow on what Sue said regarding hotspots, and in particular, I'm wondering whether the areas which are more affected, whether we can match that to the provisions of services available to the people there in terms of formal uh, arrangements, mental health support, and even community assets. And if we don't have that enough in those areas, can we make changes to those resources so that I, at least in the in the worst affected places we can make a difference? Thank you. No, thanks, Bar. Mike, the common theme here is uh, twofold. Firstly, we want a more granular level of information to help us geographically add causally and much greater level of detail. Secondly, in doing so, in thinking about this issue, we need to look at what's been done elsewhere both in terms of national studies, as Sue has said, or in terms of achieving success, as Nick has said. The proposition from Ian is that we convene a dedicated task and finish group at this Health and Wellbeing Board uh, to take this work forward, and we'll need to resource it accordingly, Mike. Uh, can I ask you to respond? Could, could I respond, Mike, just in, in there? Emma? Apologies, Mike, to talk over you. My oh, hands are working. You're um, happy. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to address all of those those great comments from everyone and, and engaging in this topic because um, actually it, it, I can reassure the board quite quite strongly around most of those comments. So um, with regards to Ian's um, comments around uh, and that locality focus, that's exactly what we're hoping to achieve through the formation of the task and finish groups to bring the um, qualitative information through around the um, what's been experienced in those areas in terms of the composition of, the, uh, of those suicides, um, but also then to work out how we're going to integrate that into the real-time surveillance elements to bring the quantitative uh, elements that Mike talks about, so that that's what, what that is referring to. With regards to um, Nick's comments around what's happening in other areas. Yes, Nick, we have um, have gone out to the national program um, and and looked at other areas um, to ensure that we are pulling through that understanding from the na national groups, um, and we are engaged through the wave program um, monies as well in, in those elements. So we are getting all of that learning coming down, which is immensely helpful. In terms of Sue's comment also around Lewis Appleby, I am actually directly engaged with Lewis um, and, and have been this week to talk about how we can bring through the uh, information from, from the um, public inquiry elements as well um, so that that's already happening um, and, and around the community asset elements that, uh, that Boyle, uh, Boyle also brought through and um, that's something that will happen through the task and finish mapping elements so yes all of those comments are very gratefully received and are already a part of the fundamental work if that is helpful to know. 
That's very helpful. So you're telling us that a task and finish group's already been created under under whose governance? So the governance structure for the task and finish groups is we have um, those for the priority districts and they are coming under the SET board. So the uh, South End Essex and Thurrock Suicide Prevention Board, which is a, an, okay. another element of governance which is in order to pull the local information into a set wide strategy. And then okay. that is also coming under the governance of the Health and Wellbeing Board as, as the final element of government. So we, we wanted to report into you for that if that is acceptable. Uh, so what I'd love you to do, Gemma, please, could you please circulate to all members, A, who's on that uh, on that task and finish group, uh, and members, if any of you wish to put your hand up, I'll leave it to go back to Gemma directly. And secondly, exactly what the scope of the task and finish group is. I, I think the scoping document's very important here, Gemma. Uh, and we as a health and wellbeing board are going to take a direct interest, not duplicating what the Suicide Prevention Board is doing, but complimenting and if giving you any resource you need. Are members you. content with that way forward? Y'all all right? We have two hands up as well, John. Um, we've got Rob Gurlis and Ian Davidson. I'm going to take Rob and then come back to Ian and then really we will need to move. Rob. Rob Gurlis. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so I say this has been this has been around a long time, and Harlow has always been a, an issue for us as well. Uh, just a couple of points. One is we have got data that is consistent, haven't we? Um, males um, of a certain age are always there. I mean, it's, it's heavily male uh, people alone. Um, so this is not going to you know we could we can contemplate a lot here, but we know a lot already. One of the things uh, that strikes me and it's something i've come across over the years um, um is that people who uh contemplate suicide it is there's a complexity a psych psychiatric complexity but it's something that comes happens very quickly that's that switch in somebody's um, um psyche uh, and they need quick access to something at that point now i don't know whether nick nick was talking about detroit and i, I don't know if it was detroit but one of the uh, uh approaches that i did see that people could go uh, to firefighters i think it was in in america they they at any time of night and they could just walk in and they it, you've got to have that access that's instant you know not something that is on a phone and uh, you know we'll get back to you and it's, it's got to be instant uh, um and i don't know whether that's been uh, addressed so thanks thanks robin your general point about not repeating stuff that we know already i know Gemma's on board but but fine points thank you ian davidson thank you thank you john um Yes, we do know about uh, uh, about the, sort of the different trends across the country, but I think we need to come back to why are they worse in Essex? And okay. I think that, and this is and this is what I can't get my head around, if I'm honest. Um, and uh, but with um, and with tendering, so I do think I want to really understand the geography, and I know Gemma said that's part of looking at also the sectors. You know, it, it has been in the past been identified that um, uh, agricultural workers have a higher rate. Um, and other certain um, sectors of, of, of um, in, in the working community. So are they the same sectors as we're having or are they different and that comparison? So it also understanding what we need. But the last thing we need to do is as a result of this is have some, is see some action. So if I can identify Sorry. in tendering that there's a certain issue in Harwich with um, dock workers, you know, I make it up, but you know, then let's get people in there quickly and let's get, and let's, we collectively as partners, and I mean, it is all partners uh, need to work in together to understand and what we're going to take because we could spend a lot of time analyzing getting to the end of it and continuing. And actually, what I want to do is find something where I can start to get people out on the streets and, and helping and getting and, and reducing these figures. Um, and understanding and understanding on the basis of an understanding of the thing. So Ian, uh, I've already asked Gemma to share the details of who's in the task and finish group, to uh, share the scoping document for that task and finish group. I think Gemma, the next thing I need you to do is to consider when you can come back to this board with the action plan that you've agreed with the Suicide Prevention Board. And I'm hoping Gemma, it's not going to be after September. John, we also have a hand up from um, uh, Anna Davey. Anna, I will take it, and then I'm really going to have to say no more, much as I regret this, but I'm so far behind. Anna? 
so it's just a thought that's crept into my mind. I'm sure it's been considered before, but are our figures anything to do with our coroner? So obviously whether a, a death is marked as a suicide or not can vary um, depending on the evidence or I think often how the coroner feels about, about the sort of circumstances. So could an explanation be that we have a coroner who's more ready to um, mark a, a, a death down as a suicide, just, just off the top of my mind? That's a very interesting point. Um, I have discussed the issue with the person who was coroner, senior coroner in September 2020, and she told me she always went out of her way to try not to declare as a, uh, as a suicide. But it's a very, so if you like, if it was down to the personal practice of the coroner, you would expect to see a change after September 20. But thanks, Anna. Uh, and apologies for moving on, everybody, but I do want you to have a very short break. Uh, we have one more item before that, which is the briefing, Claire, on the implications of the domestic abuse legislation. Now, uh, if you don't mind, Claire, in the time, the briefing, I thought, was very clear. Unless you really have to, can I just leave you to take any questions on this? So is there anything you must say in, in addition to that paper, Claire? Claire Burrell? Have I lost Claire? Claire, how's message me? I think she's struggling to work out how to uh, unmute. Uh, I'll just advise her. Are you there, Claire? Bottom left-hand screen, you should be able to... Oh, she I think she's in the out. webinar. Is she not? I've, yeah, she had just dropped out. I've um, brought her back oh. into the main session again. Uh, were there any questions on oh. this paper? And I'll come back to Claire after the coffee break if I need to. Were there any questions on this paper? So to get responsibilities under the domestic abuse legislation. There's no hands up. In the absence of that, I'm going to take us off to our short break. Um, I would be grateful if we could keep it down to five minutes. After that, just for the three people, the three sections after, Suzanne on population health management, uh, uh, Jason will be joining us for physical activity and then Susanna back to you and David uh, Akinsanya uh, around uh, the shared living piece. I will ask in all cases presenters please keep down to three or four minutes so that I have time for discussion. I'll allow a 15 minute slot for each item. Uh, Peter what do you make the time exactly? It is 11.29. At 11.35, if we can resume, please. Thanks very much. And I will come back to see if Claire's got anything to say first. Thank you. That people are aware, the audio stream will be paused, but the YouTube stream will continue to be live. So it may be helpful during the break for everybody to turn their cameras off and mute. Thank you.
Hey, Judith, do we have people back? Judith? No. Judith's not. Oh, Judith is back now. And um, yes. we've also now got Claire Borrell as well. She knows. Um, uh, yeah, that's fine. Problems, but if, if there are. Resume in a second. And Susanna, I apologise to you because you might probably got a shot when I said 15 minutes on uh, population health management. But if we can keep it down to 2025, that'd be great. Right. If we can formally. Do you make it 35, Peter? I do. Yes, I do. Peter? Yes, sorry, I was just trying to unmute and people right, are starting. So, uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope you all had a chance to stretch your legs. Uh, Claire, just uh, before the break there, we were trying to cover off on the domestic abuse paper. Uh, there were no questions being asked. Um, are you happy just to leave the paper there for, for noting on this major legislation, or did you need to say anything? Would you mind if I just pose four questions for people to consider and take back to their organisations? Okay, Claire, that's a very fair way to do it. If that's okay. Um, and so um, the first is, um, with the new duties coming into play on the 1st of April, are you aware of the guidance set out and the duties, what they mean for you as an organisation, as you as the employers? Um, do you know who takes the lead for domestic abuse in your organisation? Are you linked in to the Southend, uh, Essex and Thurrock Partnership Board? And is your organisation linked into the current activity that we are undertaking uh, to start implementing the new duties from the 1st of April? Um, there's an updated slide set that I've given to Judith to send around to the group to look at where we're at now because it's a, it's a moving feast every day. Um, but um, I would just urge people to take those questions back to their organisations because everybody's got duties and guidance laid out in the, um, in the statutory guidance. Thanks very much, Claire, for good points. And uh, I might suggest, uh, I assume Mark Corey and Ian Davidson you liaise with the other district bar and city council across Essex. So uh, if you, Claire, could liaise with Ian Davidson around those questions being asked of all our partners, all right? Thanks, Thank Claire. You. Thank Thanks you. for your understanding. Uh, Susanna, okay. we're coming on to population health management, uh, and I've had the joys of the presentation in Midland South, uh, as have others on this call. Uh, Susanna, my just my request, you're going to introduce who's coming to talk. Can we just please leave time for feedback and discussion? If I can work to finish at about 12 o'clock or just after, that would be super. Five past 12. Okay, thank you, Chair. So um, what um, the way that I think it's best to approach this isn't to really talk about kind of population health management um, in detail. Um, the paper that you have provides an overview of population health management as a um, what seems a key tool in terms of enabling really good integrated working at a very, very close local level. Um, the point of the paper is to give an update of the progress on developing population health management um, capacity and capability across all three um, integrated care systems um, that um, are part of Essex. And um, uh, it also gives an update in terms of participation from each of the three systems in um, a national programme, which is driven by NHS England, which um, provides a sort of accelerated intensive 20 weeks um, uh, supported um, <clears throat> with, with quite an, a large amount of resource to really develop capability around things like infrastructure, intelligence and interventions. Um, the paper's there, but I think the best way to tell the story is to hear it from the perspective um, of um, a GP. Um, um, and um, Dr Rachel Morant is on the call and she's one of the GPs who's involved with um, our um, initial 20 week programme in Suffolk and North Essex. Um, which took place during uh, 2020. Um, it originally kicked off in 20 uh, in January 2020, and so you'll imagine that um, the 20 weeks turned into rather more than 20 weeks. But uh, we have now completed the programme, and Rachel's going to tell you something about uh, what that's meant for her as a GP and what she's now able to do with this capability for her patients. Thank you, Susanna. Rachel, you're very warmly welcome to the Essex Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, I haven't got my camera on because I've had to do the meeting on my phone. And in order to be able to hear you, I've had to put the phone to my ear and you would get a shot of my ear. So I thought you'd probably could live without that. Um, so uh, I'm sorry about the technology, but I hope you can hear me. Um, so 
essentially I was the lead in our PCN, so our primary care network, uh, selected to uh, work with this uh, population health management. And uh, this is all quite new to us, um, but uh, I think that this is obviously going to be, you know, something that is going to be the way forward for us and, and uh, something we can build upon for the future, really. So uh, we uh, had, uh, it was obviously originally 20 weeks, but obviously, um, so we were working with uh, a group of uh, actuaries who were helping us to sort of find the data and really uh, interrogate the data so that we could find a, a group of patients that we could um, make a difference with, uh, I think is, is the best way to put it really. So uh, for our particular group, um, and there were several weeks of sort of honing down the information and really uh, narrowing it down to a group of patients that we felt that we could uh, uh, have some uh, some appropriate intervention with and making a, a difference with. So for, for our group, uh, we looked at a group of patients who were aged 74 to 89, who were on more than 10 medications um, and hadn't had any recorded falls uh, with the aim of uh, trying to prevent them from making some sort of intervention and and trying to prevent them from having falls in the future uh, because um, as I'm sure you're aware obviously that's got a big cost to their own health a big cost to the NHS and social care as well um, so uh, we worked uh, with uh, the actuarial team to to find that data um, and then I, I worked with our team in our PCN uh, to identify those patients and uh, we also had really good um, uh, uh, working relationship with our voluntary service locally um, and uh, essentially we sent out information to those patients that we had identified uh, with a pack of uh, exercises to do to help build up muscle strength um, and lots of information about our local services so there was information about a slipper exchange um, about transport um, and uh, there was uh, also information about you know trying to help uh, pick up shopping and uh, you know collect prescriptions and that sort of thing if that was appropriate as well um, we also had our pharmacist who was going to be involved with uh, making a review of all their medications seeing if there were things that you know could be appropriately stopped uh, that contributed to them at being at further risk of falls um, and although I think that it was difficult to measure sort of short-term outcomes I think anecdotally all the patients that we contacted were, were really pleasantly surprised that we had sort of uh, contacted them their families were as well and in fact we had comments that you know uh, were we going to be rolling this out to other patients as well um, but obviously in the longer term idea of is uh, you know have patients confidence in their mobility and their safety at home improve and also uh, you know the, the ultimate outcome is have we reduced the number of falls um, so I think it was a very um, because certainly for me as a GP that's not something I've ever really been involved in before uh, so I think the whole process was uh, very um, very interesting and I think uh, something that we you know can see that actually this is something that we can apply to uh, cohorts of patients in the future um, and, and uh, bring about some effective change and hopefully some sort of you know uh, some short-term mid-term out long-term outcomes that will be beneficial to them and overall to the health service as well um, so yeah that, that in a nutshell is, is, a, is a really productive process uh, involved. Thanks Rachel that's very helpful Susanna. So just to finish off, um, you'll see um, a link in the paper to a report from um, Suffolk and North East Essex, which talks about um, quite a number of case studies, including um, the one from Rachel um, summarising um, the types of projects and the difference that um, by working in this way, um, perhaps some of our PCNs have been able to, um, to make. Um, across um, Essex and across the three ICSs, um, Hertfordshire and West Essex have um, just begun um, the 20 week program and um, as you said in Mid and South Essex um, they're just in the planning stages to launch the 20 week program I think in June um, 2021. Um, in North East Essex the next steps are to broaden the approach to all of the PCNs who have not yet 
um, uh, had the opportunity to be part of the programme to this date. So we'll be covering comprehensively the remaining um, PCNs as listed. Um, we've also um, uh, incorporated the approach into other areas, including very importantly, the North East Essex End of Life project as well. So um, that's a very high level overview of population health management across Essex, um, but hopefully a glimpse also into the difference that this can make in terms of enabling closer integrated working at a very local level. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Susanna. I, I did have somebody else down to speak as well, Susanna. I don't want to miss So I do. Michelle Grant Richardson, who's our PHM project manager, is on the call. If we, I need to phone a friend for a technical answer to a question. <laughs> I, I always... I always think, you know, um, that uh, management is management is management, it's often said. And what Rachel just described is what, when I, when I spent my career in financial services, we would have described as segmentation, which is where you use all the knowledge you have about an individual to be able to drill down to understand that service that they are most likely to buy. In this case, Rachel, it seemed to me what you were doing was to drill down and understand which service is, which to which residence the falls piece is most applicable. And it's, it's all that bit, the more you create uh, the accuracy of your segmentation, the more dedicated resource you can put in that direction. So it's, uh, it's fine. I'd love to hear from other people. And I don't know if Mid and South want to say anything. Uh, you've been mentioned in dispatches several times, but are there hands up, Peter? Uh, there's no hands up currently. Uh, Joe Cripps, sorry, has just put a hand up. And you accepted the invitation, Joe. Well done. I did, I did. Thanks. Um, so just, just to note, obviously, Susanna's outlined, we, we're, we've all, we're all starting or have, will have done this 20-odd week programme with NHSE and I. Um, we've got, uh, kind of in addition to that, I think there's a lot of work to do on data and information governance and information sharing, which is all very difficult across, across the NHS, in fact, as well as across other statutory partners. We've been doing some work in Mid and South to develop an outcomes framework. So to pick some key kind of measures that we can look at at system and place and eventually PCN level to help guide our plans and thinking about what do our PCNs, what do our local alliances want to do and focus on in order to make the best impact for our residents. So there's a, there's a very structured programme that we're starting, which I'm sure we'll benefit from greatly. Uh, we're also, you know, building on the really good work that Thurrock have done and Ian Wake has led. Um, and now we've got Ronan Fenton chairing our um, population health management uh, uh, work. So I think we, we, we're starting to bring together all of those elements of data, of local knowledge, clinical leadership, et cetera, into, into a, a, a kind of coherent programme. Thanks. I must give Jane the chance to say something from the West Essex viewpoint, Jane. Jane's still with us? Yeah, no, I'm still still with you, John. Uh, yeah, so um, sim similar uh, sim similar progress be being made in, in, in West Essex. Um, we uh, have uh, at the point of, of trying to really decide on and refine the approach to segmentation. So live, live discussions go, going on about, uh, about that at the moment. Um, there's, uh, we're part of the uh, second phase of the national rollout or oh. national support program, um, which had to be for obvious reasons uh, uh, paused for, for a, a period, but, but is, is now, um, it has now been relaunched. There was a very, uh, very successful and very, very uh, highly attended workshop approximately two weeks ago. Um, and uh, we have pilot sites in uh, in West Essex and uh, in the uh, east part of Hertfordshire in particular. So, so very much playing into the uh, the, the areas that, that, that flow in through PAH. Uh, so, yeah, good progress. Thanks, Jane. That's great. Thank you. Any hands, Peter? Uh, there's no further hands at the moment. OK, well, look, can I... Thank you, Susanna, for bringing the item to the table. Rachel, for giving us that case study. Um, uh, and to all of you, best wishes. Do keep us informed and let us know if we can help. Uh, as I do have the uh, dubious privilege of chairing the East of England um, um, board around digital joining up, well, how joyous it will be when we can get to that day where there is the flow of information that enables this to be done. If, if I may, Rachel, to the less easy to identify groups and the groups that, it is, that, that at the moment we don't identify or are able to connect with. So 
willingly, but where through that very tight focus on segmentation, you can make a real big difference. And uh, I just, I, I, across the information that is held by the NHS and the information that's held uh, in our own area, if we can get to that point, I think we can do something that's just mind boggling for residents. But very best wishes with that. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I, sorry, I was just, sorry, that's the problem with doing things online. You can talk over each other, can't you? So, sorry, all I was just going to say is actually we're going to start using some of the skills that we've learned on the population health management because we're trying to target, as you say, the the sort of non-attenders for cervical screening. So uh, you, you're, you're right, we're, we're going to try and use some of the, the sort of techniques and reaching out to some of our partner organisations to try and help us uh, reach some people that don't tend to sort of come with the normal invitations to things. So, so the, there is lots of learning that we've that we've made from this this project, really. Rachel, thank you. And if you've got time to stay on for the next for one or both of the next items, these are two items now where we are particularly looking for the feedback from the GPs. I, I really am keen from the whole system of the GPs in particular. Uh, Peter, do I have Jason Fergus yet with us? Uh, let me just... Morning, check. good morning, good morning. Good morning, Jason, everyone. Good morning. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, when two months ago, Mike Gogarty is sick of me telling this story, uh, I met with Mike Gogarty and said, Mike, from our viewpoint, you as Director of Public Health, what is the biggest single thing uh, we or I can do now to enable recovery of physical and mental well-being across Essex, he answered without hesitation, physical activity. And so Neil, it was so good to hear from you earlier on this piece. And the purpose of this item today is to test the appetite of the board for really working not as an Essex County Council initiative, but on a system-wide basis for the stimulation of physical, of meaningful, meaningful physical activity across Essex. I've given it the label fit for the future. That is about micro level, the individual person being fit, enabling us to have the most meaningful, the most fulfilling uh, and the most achieving life they can because their mental, mental and physical fitness uh, enables them to live life to the full and to have a healthy uh, living profile for longer. At county level, I have no doubt that all those inequalities, Susanna, you were talking about, which are linked to deprivation, and Ian, I can be with you on this, the best way to overcome those is to ensure that we optimise the quality and quantity of employment, or to put it another way, we maximise the quantity of quality employment thus creating a level of prosperity in the county and then ensuring that we reach with that prosperity into the darkest and most deprived corners. And if we're going to do that, we need a fit and healthy workforce because that is a competitive and a more productive workforce. And so at macro level, fit for the future is enabling an Essex to compete for that quantity of quality employment. So, Jason, I invite you to say anything else you want to, but really, this is your curtain raiser to an ongoing piece where we seek the support of the Health and Wellbeing Board for a system-wide movement, I think you called it, Jason, around stimulating meaningful physical activity. Jason is, of course, the uh, driving force of Active Essex and the epitome of getting things done. Jason? Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Spencer. Good morning, everyone. And again, thank you for the opportunity in what I know is a very packed agenda. Um, as John quite rightly has said, never has been a better time for us to think and act collectively about how we, we seriously think about the deconditioning of our residents across the county as a result of COVID-19. During lockdown one, I think we all would agree, we saw, and you could see out the window and in the streets and in the community, a real increase of people being physically active, and that was really visible um, to see. Lockdown two, we started to see a slight decline and then unfortunately, and most disappointingly, in this third lockdown, we have seen a, a big decline nationally as well as here in the county. And so I'm speaking to you this morning to ask for your support in how we can create an ongoing upsurge around the county, around physical activity. Lessons learned from the local delivery pilot, the support from Sports England and Councillor Spent and colleagues, as you 
of the importance if we're going to successfully hardwire physical activity we need a whole system approach with system level support which is why i'm here today with the support of the chair on this particular agenda to define physical activity it's important that the context that we know the chief medical officer guidelines recommend 150 minutes a week and a week is seven days but i think it's really important to state that we want people to start somewhere some movement is better than no movement at all and is key for that key very much for the residents of Essex to kind of start that journey I suppose I was thinking of trying to bring to life an example here and so a really good example is Park Run I think everyone is familiar with Park Run and Park Run talking to, to colleagues at Park Run locally um, they identify success if their lap time every Saturday is getting slower because if it's getting slower that means that more people are coming out for the first time more people are walking and taking those first important steps and they're very much not trying to emulate some O'Farrow and trying to get around as quick as they can. But we also know that obviously the social benefits around social isolation, um, but creating new friends and connecting with people is also an important part of what something like Park Run does. I'm today therefore collectively saying that how can we create this, this upsurge across the county um, as we move out of this current pandemic? Professor Chris Whitty, this is County Council, full council in a motion. And our very own, as you heard, Dr. Mike Gockerty, have all supported the absolute importance of physical activity in avoiding issues such as social isolation, safeguarding physical and importantly mental health, and tackling obesity and other such associated diseases. As we prepare a roadmap to return to play and as lockdown restrictions ease, I asked the board to support a paper returning in April that will articulate the importance of how together we can create this upsurge. As John has described already, of the working title Fit for the Future. Fit for the Future, as a statement, calls together four very important strands. The first one of those, and Dr. Mark, you'll be pleased to hear this one at the front and center, is action. A list of measurable actions that will contribute to the shift in moving physical activity levels here across the county. The second one is social marketing. Absolutely recognized from an array of conversations that I've been having, a multi channeled communication campaign which will focus on behavior change but using real people to tell their story and support and encourage people like them to be marked to be more physically active. Thirdly, the need for a strategy, and I say a strategy, but I say that with a small s, a clear and impactful strategic document that identifies the key foundation for success and reaffirms the key strategic priorities which I would like this board and the board to endorse. And then finally, ways of working. To be able to create a systematic change, we need to ensure that we can reach all parts of the system. And that's where you come in and your help and support to galvanize that, to make that happen. So in conclusion, I'm asking for the board for, to support this approach, support the importance of physical activity and support me to bring back and return to you on the 28th of April with more detailed plans and a paper. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jason. And uh, I know Sunil had his hand up earlier, so I'll bring Sunil in first, and then Peter, I'll be asking you for other hands. Dr. Sunil Gupta. Yeah, so the health benefits for exercise, everybody knows about, but perhaps people don't know about how extensive they are. So regular physical exercise reduces the risk of heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, colon cancer, breast cancer, early death, as well as osteoarthritis, hip fractures, falls amongst elderly, depression and dementia. So the risks are really very extensive and the benefits are really extensive. Thank you. Absolutely with you. Peter, what hands do we have? And uh, as I say, I'm very keen to hear from all our medical expertise in the room. Yeah. Um, you got my hand up, but I'll go at the end. So we've got um, uh, Councillor Moran, Councillor Peter Davey, and we've got Boy uh, Taylor. If I can go with Peter, then John, then Boy or Peter. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, in order to support this activity, all local councils have already been given the details of the relationship managers at Active Essex. Local councils are being asked to add value to existing provisions, and they are being asked to work with existing community groups to enhance and support provision to make this university acceptable. They are also being encouraged to work with neighbourhood local councils to combine efforts to support residents. Pooling resources can make new ideas easier to manage, and the call for venues request from Active Essex was promoted throughout our membership. And Active Essex are also speaking at our next conference on youth engagement on the 28th of April. 
So we are actually, John, already very actively trying to implement this initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Can I just ask, you know, you initiated uh, health and well-being teams or committees with parish councils. How many of those are in place now? Um, oh, sorry, uh, about um, 40, John. If ever you want to do a webinar with them, I'm very happy to get involved, Peter, OK? Yes, thank you, John. The great joy of the webinar, which we didn't have a year ago, but it does enable participation without travel, which is great. John Moran. Thank you. I'm not going to embarrass people by asking a question I asked recently at a meeting. <laughs> people here do that 150 minutes a week. Um, I'm not going to do that. That would be inappropriate. That's for you to think about. We're leaders within society. We're leaders of our community. One thing I do find, and I think some of the people who you work alongside and probably yourselves is finding nowadays is that we get days where we're sitting here doing this. I've got two days uh, next week and one day this week where I will spend literally nine hours in a row with a half hour break at the moment. It's not good. We have to change that culture. We also uh, need to get a culture whereby somebody's employed, their employer actually takes some care of them I know why. Yes, I second, John. The blood tissue is worried about? Or? No, she said all. Excuse me, John. I think somebody's uh, not realising they're unmuted and having a conversation. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, hey, John. I think we need to encourage employers to take a role in this to actually just try and either give a break, a meaningful break where people can do some exercise or sort of support it. Speaking about the parish council, some of them have done some wonderful work and the outdoor um, exercise equipment that I've seen carried in several parishes in in my area have been brilliant and they are being used but they possibly need to be used a bit more thank you very much and john thank you and the point about employers of course that's an, another piece of the fit for the future it, it is in the interest of the employer to ensure their workforce are fit and healthy they'll have less absentee and uh, more productivity all the rest uh boyle yeah thank you and uh, thanks jesse for presenting this paper i would really like to um, voice my approval of this process and endorse the paper and what you asking for. We cannot overestimate the importance of physical activity for the advantages as already mentioned by Sunil. Um, I think we've got a challenge now because of the change in the way we work. Um, some people, the, the only major activity they do is to commit to work and that's been removed recently with this remote working. And um, from what uh, Councillor Domra was saying about our commitment to sitting in front of computer all day, I think it's been mentioned previously that uh, Mike instituted a change in the SS County Council, which I think it would be better if everybody's adopting it across the system, which is to have a, a specific period where people are encouraged to move away from their desk and not book back-to-back -back meetings with no break in between. The the idea which also been uh, popularized in Barcelona, the street tag, where you know schools are encouraged to move around, and this is being measured digitally to see how much activity they are doing. I think that should be also pushed across the system to to make sure we can catch our people young. And that message should be sent to all that activities, you know, give you a better life, a good quality life, and it's something that should be encouraged by all. Thank you. Thank you, Boya, and some very good points there. Peter, do we have, uh, and by the way, uh, uh, those of us, John Moran and I uh, on the County Council, know that a colleague who thought they were doing not bad at having exercise, because they walk the dog first thing in the morning and again late at night, has recently gone down with a deep vein thrombosis. Absolutely, because during the middle of the day, they were stuck at that computer for eight, nine hours. So, Peter, more hands up. Yeah, there are four hands before mine. So we've got, um, I think it was Anna Davy, Paul Burstow, then Hassan, and then Gemma Mindham. Let's go in that order then, Anna. Thank you, John. So I'd just like to echo what Boyer says and support this drive to increase physical exercise. I think we need to look at what has worked well and focus on that. So I particularly like the Daily Mile in primary schools. So I think that needs to come back again. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, I think walking groups that 
start in GP surgeries, um, Walk for Life, I think they were called. They, they've been around for years. Um, they, they work really well, and I'd like us to maybe sort of reinvigorate that program, that, that sort of local volunteer walking leaders who, who gather people together to walk two or three times a week. Um, I think walking's really popular. It's free. Um, I, think, I think we should focus on that. Um, I also just wonder whether there's something to be said about subsidizing some clubs that, that improve physical activity in children, because um, having got three kids, I know just how expensive it can be when they're all doing gymnastics and swimming oh, and hello. everything Is else. And actually, awesome. that's probably no, Dr. Tyre beyond the reach. Bio, I think you may not realize that you're unmuted. Sorry, Anna. Boy, are you unmuted? He's muted now. Okay. I just think it's beyond the reach of, of lots of people. And now that we are, um, you know, we, we're about to go into a prolonged period of financial strain, I think we just need to be mindful of the fact that lots of parents would love to encourage more physical activity in their children there but it's just really quite expensive walking but actually what about subsidizing some of the more um sort of football clubs and you know i know my my children's primary school you know everything is now paid for you can't do after school activities that the parents don't have to pay and um you know that just puts it beyond the reach of lots of people so that's my A great point Sana. And on the walking for life piece, which I've been participating in the past, you know, one just recognised the huge challenges that GP practices have uh, over the next six months, really, as you carry on with vaccination. So the question then is, how can the rest of the system support the reenactment of that, given the pressures on you? Paul? Paul Burstow? Yes, uh, thank you very much, John. And um, really, really important, as everyone has said, and very much echoed um, John's points about the importance of uh, employers being engaged as part of the sort of reactivation. Although I think the other point that I picked up really is this point about uh, the deconditioning, particularly of our older population, and the need to think about how uh, we, through our various uh, voluntary sector organisations and others, and particularly our GPs are able to reach out to that population. However, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, uh, I remember uh, the conversations we had uh, on this board back in uh, the uh, um, beginning of 2019, when the county received the uh, significant, uh, really good news of funding for, for sports uh, related activities. I just wondered um, in what way the learning and evaluation from that program of activity has been fed into this work in terms of designing the approach that's going to be taken. Thanks, Paul. That's a great point. I'll come back in a second, if I may tell because it's, it's well worthy of Jason responding to it. Uh, uh, Hassan? Uh, thank you. I'll try and be quick, because I think I'll just end up echoing everyone's comments. But um, some of this does take me back to about five years ago, I think, when, when I used to chair our clinical meetings and used to go on for about three hours. And I remember buying this cheap uh, hourglass from, from eBay uh, that, that, that has, I think, about five minutes on it. And, and I had this plan, so every 30 minutes, everybody had to stand up in the meeting, and the meeting would carry on. And I'd turn the time around, and we'd stand up for five minutes, move around, then sit down, and the meeting would carry on. And I'm just thinking, you know, we need to start being a bit more innovative about how we maybe encourage exercise when people are sat at screens. Um, but, but really, the, the point was that, as well as the health benefits that everyone has, has highlighted, it's the social aspect of doing exercise, joint exercise, and I think that's what people are lacking. And there are some constraints at the moment, obviously, in terms of being able to go out and exercise with others. Um, but I think that's the thing we need to start planning for and rolling out. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I started um, running again in the practice to try to get some people out. So we had some people, I think six in pairs, running and walking, socially distanced for the police amongst you. Um, and so we were, you know, we were trying to do this, but even then there was some anxiety for, amongst people about doing this. And are we allowed to? Are we allowed to exercise, you know, you know together, um, even though we were doing it uh, as a bubble? And so there is something about educating people. Um, and my last point really is just exercise just needs to be about or physical activity needs to be fun. Um, you know, nobody will do it unless it's fun. So for children, you know, that means team sports, after school clubs, or whatever to make it interesting for adults. Maybe it's the social interaction that you get as a result of it, 
or whatever, but, but it just doesn't need to be a chore. Uh, and that's, that's the thing that we need to focus on to get more and more people involved. And it'll be different for all sorts of groups, different for people in deprived areas, different for people in affluent areas. We just need to be able to adjust to allow for it so, so more and more people will take part. Tom, but great points everybody's making. Thanks, Hassan. Gemma? Hi, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Just going to be really quick and say that the CVSs are all very much behind this um, and very much linked in at a local level to their active networks. And also, uh, we met uh, last week, we all met with the new uh, physical activity social prescribing coordinator for the area. So we're all looking forward to uh, working with her, Kimberly, and just making sure that we are reaching into communities to our networks, but also that we're um, inspiring sort of creative thought around um, activities, physical activities that can get people out and about informally as well as formally. Thanks. I know you broke up a bit there, Gemma, but I think I got the points. Thanks. Um, Peter, fairly. Yeah, um, yeah, so three quick reflections from me. First of all, definitely the uh, role of employers to think about how we can support our workers. Uh, I mean, I used to have a guaranteed 10,000 steps a day uh, without even thinking, without even making an effort. And uh, that's disappeared now. You really have to find the time. So I think anything employers can do to build in the time would be helpful. Uh, secondly, I think Jason mentioned the park run or somebody did. Now, I live in Chelmsford and I think the park run was one of the most successful in the world. Several thousand. That's gone because of yeah. COVID restrictions. I'm not sure whether that's a district or a police or a public health matter. But if you can't do park run, what else is there that we could do to help replace, replace that activity for thousands of people? And the third issue is anything kind of behavioural insights or others that we could do. Because Jason, lockdown one was different to lockdown two and three because the weather was nice. Uh, lockdown three, it was cold, it was wet, uh, it was dark. Um, so what can we do at winter time uh, to help people uh, actually get active? Okay, Peter. I mean, the park run will come back. And part for this for me is how you get people back to good old habits, if you like. So how do you bring it back just as the patient participation groups and doctor surgeries We've got to rebuild that heritage, what Paul was describing as reconditioning, I think. Uh, now, Jason, uh, you've been asked to feedback on how we're going to get the lessons from uh, the previous piece, um, from the LDP pilot, uh, with all that we've learned there about transferring ownership. Uh, you've been asked about how we might create any systems around subsidising sports clubs, which you, uh, you know. And I think the third point I'd like to just come back to the board on how do you want people, how do you want to engage with people now uh, so that they develop the strategic plan you bring back in April rather than you? So, Jason, those three points. Indeed, thank you very much. Um, so I'll take the first point around local delivery pilot, which is still very much alive. Um, every six months, we produce process evaluation reports with our evaluation partner, which is the University of Essex. And I suppose I'll just very quickly share um, three key headliners as, as a learning um, in answer to Paul's question that are actually being embedded into our thinking and very much the conversations that we're having here this morning. The first one is moving away from disconnected delivery. What we've seen a lot of before the pilot, Paul, was disconnected delivery. Lots of things happening that are not connected, having no real impact. So what we're moving to is a much more collective action. And the conversation this morning, the concept of the future and the strands that I, I discussed with you, start to create that collective action, that movement, though I dare say, which will therefore have a much greater and deeper impact. The second point is moving away from what we've learned is community consultation. Actually, what we want to get to is co-creation with the community, actually understanding the communities using our asset-based community development approach for what's important to them, what matters to them, and shape an intervention and opportunity around them rather than just say, right, you're going to do Zumba because I think that's best for you, but actually that may well be not the case. A really good example of that in Harlow, we're working with a, a diverse community called the, the Garden and Community Union. And what they've done is identify some health inequalities that they have, but then they've come up with actually the interventions that they want to do as a community. So we're working with them to provide the instructors uh, and the facilitators so they can take part in the sessions that they want rather than prescribing it. And then thirdly, moving away um, from this concept that we have of transactional relationships. So everything's about passing, I'm gonna fund this, so off you go and then I'll walk away because we think that the job or the or it's actually happened correctly, but actually what we want is collaborative partnerships because if we get the collaborative partnerships, what you'll see is long-term sustainability. 
rather than this con concept of a transactional. So it's very live. Um, our last sponsors meeting, um, there's a, a recent document which, uh, if, if chairs happy for me to do so, I will circulate called People and Places, which is a summary of all of the pilots and the learnings thus far, which has been nationally received very well, including huge contributions from, from Essex as well. And that is acting for the sector as a whole as a real bedrock of how we move forward okay. our learnings around system thinking. The second Can question- more, Jason, please? The what, second question was around subsidies. Um, we have, um, through the last couple of lockdowns, been able to support, um, Anna, in answer your question, local clubs to how they can build back better um, as a result of that. And we recognise that part of that challenge for them will be that people will not be able to afford subscriptions due to some financial challenges. There are several pots of resources that are available and we're currently working with sports clubs across the sector. What we mustn't also forget are schools have also got a dedicated funding resource called the Primary School Sport Premium. So we are working with um, the Education Colleague team to make sure that schools think about when they bring in external providers, how can they look at using some of that Primary School Sport Premium to reduce and maybe even remove the cost so that those young people that are struggling to continue those clubs can continue to kind of take part. I think, was there a third one? How do you wish to engage with board members so that this plan you produce in April is their plan, not yours? Indeed. So as I alluded to, and I think uh, John sent a note out yesterday, um, you're next planning to meet on the 28th of April. What I'd very much like to do is just form a very small, perfectly formed um, task and finish group um, that I can work with to shape some of the detail that sits behind Fit for the Future. And so, John, if that's okay with you, I'd very much ask for any volunteers that would be interested in, in joining um, no more than two meetings, possibly one meeting, where I can present and, and go into a bit more detail some of those ideas and concepts and, and get your support and your suggestions and your comments um, so I can bring something back with the relevant detail um, on the 28th of April, please. Okay. Uh, when you say small, we'd equally want it to be representative, Jason, so it'd be great to have somebody from the voluntary sector. I suspect Peter would love to bring somebody from the parish councils uh, and the our district councils may wish to. Uh, I, of course, am particularly focused on our GP colleagues. So it may have to be five or six. Um, are there any hands in the air now, Peter? If not, we will send you a note after the meeting. Are there hands in the air, Peter? Uh, Ian Davidson has his hand up. Ian? Just a very quick one. Would it be worth using the ESCG because all those people are already on that? Uh, Jason and Ian, could you have a conversation offline but if anybody who's not on there, Ian, wants to participate, I'd, I want to be inclusive here rather than exclusive. I'm not sure that you have the GP, the primary care sector, do you, Ian? We do have a representative, but they would always be very welcome to join anyway. So, but we'd certainly put an invitation out to join that meeting anyway. I certainly see the point of trying to keep it linked in. So, uh, Jason, Ian, you have a chat, would you? But anybody who is attending today who has a burning desire to be involved or who wants to nominate somebody, please, uh, this, I really want this to not be Essex County Council. I really want this to be Essex Health and Wellbeing Board and the whole system, all right? And then, by the way, to migrate to do, off to be owned by employers and so on. Yeah, I'm unable to raise my hand, but it's um, Samantha Glover and I would love to be involved. Sam, uh, then that love to be involved should be converted to you are involved, Sam. Peter Davey now has his hand up as well. Peter? Uh, yes, um, obviously our health and wellbeing officer, Daniel Frost, will be delighted to be involved in this initiative. Okay. And Yara could rely on you, Peter. All right. <laughs> right. Are we happy to move on? And thank you for that. I, I do want to minute this. So I would like to be able to say that we have unanimous support for this uh, creation of a, 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 a strategic movement to drive up physical, uh, effective, um, sorry, meaningful physical activity uh, and to contain within it, and I think one or two of you made this point, uh, how we ensure suitable urgency over the coming weeks and months. Now, please, I, I've said unanimous, if I will never know whose hand it is. If you don't agree with it, uh, please feel free to put the hand up. And Peter, you must never tell me, but does anybody have an objection to me calling this a unanimous agreement? I can't see any nodding, any shaking of heads or hands up. So. Okay, well, 
Uh, it's not quite GDPR, so I'm allowed to uh, opt out rather than opt in here. So thank you. Right, we come to the final uh, significant item. And I was very grateful when Susanna asked if she could bring this item to the table today. And if I can welcome David Akinsanya, um, because it's actually mirrored entirely something that's going on within the County Council. So Susanna, I'm going to ask uh, you to introduce the item uh, and if we can uh, ask David to speak for four or five minutes, but then I would like to bring Chris Martin in to explain the absolute mirror of this, but with a different cohort of people. So, so uh, Susanna. Okay, thank you, Chair. So um, at previous health wellbeing boards, we've um, discussed um, the issue about loneliness and isolation. Um, in my team, we've got the benefit of uh, David, David Akintani, who's just joined us, who works with us part time. And um, in the rest of his time, he has another rather interesting role as a journalist working with the BBC. And uh, David shared with us a project he'd um, undertaken with BBC One that was aired very recently. And it struck me that it had a real resonance with these discussions at the board. So David's going to tell you about the project that he did um, and uh, the programme that was aired a few weeks ago. Thanks, Susanna. David, you're very warmly welcome. And again, this is an item where I'm very keen to get the feedback from the medical experts on whether you think this is something that we should be uh, devoting time to and how you could help, uh, if at all. David? Thank you. I'm just checking that everyone can hear me OK. And now you're quite quiet. OK. <clears throat> um, so before I came to work here, I was working at a day centre for the elderly. And one of the things that I was really concerned about was about the loneliness that a lot of these people felt. Many of them were still living in the same houses that they raised their families in. So they had spare rooms, um, but they were lonely. And I was looking around for some way of dealing with that. And I came across these schemes, which brings both together um, people who um, need company. And can I just make a really strong point here? They're not there as carers they're there as company. So the idea is, is that, that they match people together, um, an older person who's got a spare room with a younger person who perhaps can't afford to get on the housing market and wants to move out of home, of, of their family home and, and needed somewhere to stay. And the, the schemes, there are many of them run by different social enterprises normally, um, where they actually match people to bring them together. And um, this idea, as far as I was concerned, was a, a really interesting way of the loneliness that a lot of older people are feeling. And it also offers something to the younger person as well, which is the ability to have somewhere to live, somewhere secure, um, where they can build a relationship and a friendship with the person who they're living with. My concerns initially were all about safeguarding. And obviously, all of these organisations take that very seriously. And also because of COVID. I mean, people have been placed together during COVID and the, the, the right protocols have taken place. So I just wanted to, to express to you that um, it's something that I've been really interested in. Um, and because I've worked with elderly people, um, I, I, I just know that, and, and a lot of my friends have got parents at the age where they're starting to worry about them maintaining their independence in their own home which is what I think a lot of people as they get older want to do. Um, the idea of moving into a, an old people's home isn't, it's not the right time yet. They've still got the ability to stay in their home if they had support. Um, in the film, we talked a lot about the, the, the sharers, but what, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that um, I spoke to some of the children of the people who were having people moving into their house and actually the relief for those children. I mean, they're obviously grown up with their own families was was immense the fact that they knew there was someone in there in their in the house which made them feel secure about their parents if they were in a position where they might fall over there's someone there to, to help um like i say though it's really important to distinguish between the companionship of, of the house sharer um and that, that they're not carers and that if they need caring facilities they would still be they would still be uh, you know needed by the people um who, who were who were isolated and lonely so, I mean, that, that's as much as I've got to say about it, really. It's, it's a really well, thanks, David. thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. Has Chris Martin joined us? Here, John. Yeah, so Chris, you're going to talk about a, a bit different, but it's all about the principle of sharing house for mutual benefit, Chris. 
Yeah, there are some parallels in what we're proposing and, and what David's just described. We have a scheme at the moment which is called Shared Lives, and we're proposing to bring that, it's currently commissioned, but we're proposing to bring that back in-house because we want to um, extend the reach and the variation within that kind of scheme. Essentially, it's similar to what David described, but more focused around people with learning disabilities, uh, whereby um, people who have um, the time and the space within their own homes um, offer... Uh, their home to someone with a learning disability. Uh, at the moment, those placements, for want of a better way of describing them, are, are, are for people with learning disabilities on a long-term basis. But we think there's the potential to, to vary um, those possibilities, perhaps with sort of more task orientated um, placements, um, more sort of short-term or sort of fixed-term to give people with learning disabilities some training, and some confidence in terms of giving them the skills uh, and the, the, the abilities to look after themselves and live much more kind of independently. But there is, as kind of David has described, there's a kind of potentially a sort of two-way benefit here. And um, we think that people may sort of preclude themselves from joining a shared life scheme as carers, because at the moment, the commitment is long-term. We're wondering that if, if there was an option for shorter-term placements to be made with them, and more kind of task orientated and kind of focused on an outcome and on an end point, whether we would kind of potentially open ourselves up to a wider range of carers and a wider range of perhaps people in the sort of circumstances that David has just, just described. So there, there are definite parallels. Um, we think there are real opportunities for people learning disabilities in the broadening out of such a scheme. But yes, it, there's the potential for it to kind of be a two way street and for people who are carers um, for that to perhaps tackle their own sort of feelings of isolation, but certainly the feelings of being focused around something and sort of having a sort of meaningful and purposeful way forward through their own lives could be, so there's some sort of mutual benefit um, within such a scheme. Very good. So both aspects of sharing one's home uh, to benefit somebody else. And, and in there, of course, you get two options, don't you? That longer term piece of a uh, uh, somebody moving in uh, well, actually, they could both be short and long term, David, couldn't they? Because you might have somebody who comes in uh, with a view to staying a year or two years. They're probably going to move on in their lives. I've actually been chair of a charity that's operated such a scheme. So I do understand the practical, practical challenges of it in getting that matching to work, David, which is where I thought you were so right to talk about the need for the matching service. But do we have any hands up, Peter? We've got uh, Sunil Gupta and Councillor Peter Davey. Very useful, thanks. Because what we really need to understand is how challenging this will be as we look to expand Chris Martin's scheme across the county uh, and then ponder David's one. So, Sunil? So I'd support these projects and there's good evidence that loneliness is associated with having high blood pressure, heart attacks and strokes. And loneliness is meant to be as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. I didn't realise that. Peter Davey? Yes, thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, just to make everyone aware that um, quite a few local councils have formed links with local care homes to offer a pen pal service. This has also been extended to uh, gardening projects and local allotments and providing gifts and cards to those residents who don't have any visitors or family uh, in order to keep them uh, very much interactive and not feeling lonely. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, Peter? Uh, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. There's no other hands up at the moment. I think as members consider this, what may be the best way to go with this is if I could ask members to have a think about it. The challenge for Chris, uh, because that's the scheme we've got going live, Chris, isn't it, at the moment? And David, you know, we want to uh, look at yours in due course. But Chris, the challenge we're finding is how you can get enough people to know and have confidence in this to put themselves forward. Is that a fair description, Chris? Yeah, I think it is, John. Um, but I think we're, in a sense, we're limited by the, the scope of the current scheme. To okay. a sense. And I think that's my point around if we introduce some kind of variation in terms of the ask of people, then we might open ourselves up to potential carers who otherwise you know, wouldn't have considered becoming a shared lives carer. Um, so I, so I really do genuinely think there's potential there. And I, so I'd like us to start with learning disabilities, but I think there are, there's huge opportunities here. For example, 
um, for people who have uh, mental health needs, perhaps kind of returning from hospital, that a shared lives type of placement could offer a sort of intermediary um, period of time between hospital and returning to the community. Not for everyone, but I'm just wondering whether there might be some folk who would sort of benefit from that and a sort of gentle reintroduction and back into their communities and a, and a shared lives placement or something. Um, and, you know, I did take what David said, Chris, they're not going to be a carer. And so I, I guess that's just where you've got to get that piece. Sorry, David. Oh, Chris. No, that, oh, that, yeah, that's just my sloppy terminology, John. Thank you. Yeah, it's just uh, important. If there are no other hands, I would be very grateful if uh, members of the Health and Wellbeing Board would consider any more feedback they can give us. Uh, and if you ever wanted, Chris, uh, a few GPs might help you uh, um, almost have a focus group of potential people who we could just ask what they think of the idea. It'd be quite interesting if you went to uh, a group of uh, fit on their own 70 year olds or whatever to uh, find, I, I'm not being ageist, uh, to uh, just ask them what they think of the idea and how it could be made attractive. That might help you understand how to produce the service more. Yep, that sounds like a helpful suggestion, John, thank you. Certainly we would, um, there's the sort of primary care networks and the GP networks could be valuable sources of future um, care options. Okay. Uh, David Akinsayed, can I offer you the last word? David, I, 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 can you hear me? Yeah, um, just to say that I actually had eight, you, you can see in the film that I spent eight years looking after an elderly lady. Um, and the, what I got back from that was huge. In fact, it changed my career because I then went on to work with the elderly. So it is a scheme that I think a lot of people out there have got a big heart. I think lots of people want to help. And I think it's a good way of helping both sides. Absolutely. Okay. Susanna, sorry, I offered David the last word, Susanna, but you are the sponsor of the item. Uh, no, I mean, it's something that certainly be really interesting to explore, perhaps in um, North East Essex, where we've got um, a, a specifically got an, uh, an ageing population. And um, I think, as, as David said, there's something about just really kind of giving people the idea, because quite often people are, are really worried um, about the situation their parents are in or um, about their, their, their own kind of prospects. And this might be an idea they've never thought about. So there's an awful lot to be said about just sharing some stories and then seeing um, what takes off and what follows from that. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's nothing else to be said on that item, uh, the forward plan has been shared with you, somewhat overtaken by the practical problems we ran into with the organisation of the main meeting, as I described in the note yesterday, which I hope you've all seen. So we will meet again on the 28th of April, where we will do the formalities uh, and then have two items. But Mark Corey, thank you very much for your suggestion that we look at the issues around uh, young people, special education needs, and we'll incorporate that into a follow-up on the Ofsted uh, uh, report. Uh, and then it's where you will get the chance to consider your, your strategic plan around the stimulation of physical activity. Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to raise an item at this stage? Peter, do we have any hands up? There are no hands up, uh, and I would just uh, encourage people to go for a walk if they have uh, 10 minutes as well. Uh, because we are giving you, I think, 15 minutes back, Peter, generously. So, yes, please do enjoy. Have a good, good, strong walk. Can I just thank everybody for their participation? You GPs, you've got so much on, my dear friends in primary care. Nick and Tom in the acutes, I am just acutely conscious of all your pressures. Thank you so much for being part of what's been a lengthy meeting. But to every one of you.